Hello everyone and welcome back to the live stream. It's been a couple months since last time. Uh, glad to have you all joining us live or not live if you're watching after. Um, before we get Donald on, let's just take a minute, um, let everyone get on the stream. Let me know if the audio is okay or if it's too quiet or what. We got people from Lib Libya, Iowa, Japan, Florida, Germany, Kenya, awesome, Texas. We've got uh, Ed from Practical Networking joining us from Hawaii. Welcome, glad to have you join us. Audio's good, awesome. So let's get right into it. Um, today, I'm bringing back Donald, also known as the Packet Thrower. I had him on a couple months ago, I think, and he showed us some uh, networking automation, like a CCNA stuff, and also some stuff outside of the CCNA for automation. And I definitely learned a lot from that. And today, I'm going to learn a lot again because we're, he's going to be showing us about Aruba Networks. Now, Aruba is a subsidiary company of HPE, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, as far as I know it. Um, and they're known mainly for their switching and wireless. Um, well, Donald can correct me after if I'm wrong on that. But um, if you're studying for your CCNA and you've only been exposed to Cisco, Cisco IOS, I think it's a good idea to get some exposure to these other vendors like Juniper or like Aruba. Um, now, in terms of your studies, if you're going for your CCNA, absolutely, just focus on Cisco IOS and learn that. But definitely in your career, you'll be exposed to all sorts of different vendors. So I think it's um, a good opportunity. Um, personally, in my short career, I've been exposed to, I work on Cisco, Juniper, Palo Alto, Fortinet, uh, F5, so many different vendors, but I have never touched a, an Aruba device. So this will be a first for me too. I'll be learning along with all of you guys. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask in the comments. Um, I'll try to interrupt Donald at appropriate times to ask those questions and I'm sure I'll have questions of my own too. So let's get right, in, let's get right into it. Let's bring Donald on. Hey Donald, you're on. Hello. Oh. Hey, welcome, awesome. welcome back. It's been a while. Yeah, good to see that your uh, channel survived having Kelvin on. Yeah, yep. We're gonna we're gonna do that again, and uh, you know, fingers crossed it uh, doesn't get deleted. <laughs> no, that was that was a good stream with Kelvin. Um, I noticed you have your Fortinet shirt on for your Aruba stream. Perfect. Yeah, it seemed appropriately ironic. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Um, so, how has everything been in these couple months since our last stream? How's work going? Oh, I was being stupid busy. Stupid busy? Yeah, yeah. It's a similar thing for me here, but, you know, we get over Every it. Turn around, they throw uh, another project at me, and so I've, I've learned to stop turning around. I just, <laughs> stop turn, just look forward, yeah. Yeah, don't turn around. Absolutely do not turn around. Awesome. So, um, what are you going to show us today? Well, I figure what I do is I'll show you the how to get set up on a Aruba lab, and we can play around with um, the virtual topology a bit. And then I also have some uh, physical switches so we can get around some of the um, limitations that the Aruba will have when you're playing with it. And then depending on time or whatnot, uh, we might dive into wireless and security. Otherwise, we'll just save that for another stream. So uh, um, cool. uh, I think last time we went on for like three, four hours. Uh, yeah, that was, that was a big stream. <laughs> A... Yeah, so uh, I don't think we're going to do that. Yeah, um, sure, sure. <laughs> but uh, sounds good. Yeah, uh, well, uh, I'm sure you guys will uh, have some fun with this. There, we'll uh, we'll try and highlight some of the differences of how you do stuff with Aruba, how we get set up in the lab, and then uh, if we get uh, deeper into it and there's interest, we'll uh, just keep building on it and making it go more advanced and advanced. It should be fun. Sure, sure. Are there any like uh, major differences up front between Cisco and Aruba that people should know? Or well, Cisco's or Cisco's a good vendor. <laughs> okay, that's it. Is that a difference? <laughs> uh, just have to throw a little bit of shade. Um, <laughs> the difference is mainly um, Aruba is uh, they try to simplify configs, and that can go good and bad depending on your logic. Okay. Uh, yeah. HP's been kind of at a war for a while. Uh, they had their pro curve switches where they did their uh, 
VLANs and stuff completely different than everyone else. And then um, they uh, ended up making their data center switches, which were um, kind of a dumpster fire. They were based on the comware, the old 3Com stuff. Hmm. And uh, everyone hated them. So then they said that uh, they thought they were going to buy Arista, which is a data center company, a lot right, like uh, right. Nexus. And uh, uh, they basically trashed all their product lines, saying, like, oh, yeah, we know Comware sucks, and um, uh, we're uh, going with Arista, and Arista rejected the buyout offer. Okay. And <laughs> so then they kind of looked around and said, well, we have Aruba, so uh, this is our networking now. Okay. <laughs> So, Interesting um, history. It's, there. Uh, it's a good evolution. Uh, Arista is actually, or Arista, Aruba is um, pretty good at um, automation uh, kind of side of things. Uh, they're good at uh, endpoint enablement, and um, okay. obviously they integrate nicely with the Aruba suite there. So if you have clear paths, you can do certain things that you can't do with, um, like, say, Cisco Ace as easily. Hmm. And uh, so if you have Aruba wireless, uh, there are some synergies that uh, will let you utilize those features. So, um, all in all, uh, there's not going to be too many. It's not like Juniper where like everything's completely different. There, right, this right. is going to be mostly uh, similar enough that uh, it can be annoying because you, you you probably appreciate when you're typing like a command that it's just slightly different. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's against it. Like uh, I'm working on ASAs now instead of, instead of show. IP interface brief. They have show interface IP brief. That's fun. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. The, that kind of stuff there. Yeah, so yeah. That's, uh, that's going to be the main thing. I Just imagine. different enough. Yeah. Okay. Cool. But uh, yeah. So why don't we um, just get started with the bare bones? Yeah, for sure. Want to share your screen? Yeah. Let me just see if I boomer this a lot. Oh, we got a. Comment I never here. use that here. Guy in the comments yeah. says, uh, Jonathan says, before I joined my org, they bought a ton of Aruba switches in the mid 2000s, only to throw them out a couple months later. That's unfortunate. <laughs> yeah, well, I can. Uh, Aruba's come a long way. They were, the mm. original switches were um, not great. And then um, when they were basically rebranded uh, Proker switches, they weren't great. But now they're the new thing. They're okay. Okay. Nice. But I mean, there's a uh, there's no um, if you learn and uh, work with an Aruba network, you can do a lot worse. I mean, hmm. extreme exists. Hmm. Yeah, I um, okay, so. <laughs> yeah, I don't really hear a lot of negative stuff about Aruba. So yeah, yeah. it's um, they're not bad. Uh, they're just uh, if you're trying to, it's usually when you get into the nitty gritty that is um, where we start having issues. Okay, so I go screen here and I pick this monitor this should work on nicely did you see a fancy web page yes I do all right now we're okay. full screen on your screen cool yeah I find a few share applications and presentations that never ends up working well because uh, you change apps and it uh, yeah, yeah. blows on for sure all right, so this uh, a lot of you won't actually see this website there, but this is uh, the actual Aruba page where you download things. And let's just maybe make that a bit bigger. There, how's that? Uh, yeah, it looks good to me. Okay, so under here, what we do is we go to software. And they, uh, like any other vendor, they have a bunch of uh, solutions available nowadays. So the mobility controller, this is the wireless. Uh, switches is most of what we're planning on talking about today. ClearPass is their uh, 802.1x uh, policy manager, kind of like Cisco ICE. Uh, Airwave is wireless stuff. Access points is wireless stuff. SD-WAN is actually wireless stuff, because what they did is they took the wireless controller and said, yeah, this can do SD-WAN. OK, interesting. And then uh, the other stuff there is basically just a uh, mix of various servers and stuff. Like Central is the web management for um, uh, for the uh, switches there. And if we have time, I'll show you what that looks like. But basically, you can essentially manage things like Moraki. OK, interesting. But what we'll do is we'll go switches. And if you're building your own lab, the easiest thing to do is to scroll down until you see OVA. 
And then you just, uh, at the top is the most recent release, and then uh, the older releases go down, obviously. So the first, uh, the latest release is 10.07.10. And then the other thing that I've downloaded is NetEdit, which is a tool for essentially managing your switches. So when you download this, this is an OVA file. And then what, if you want to work with this in CML or uh, GNS3, what you need to do is you need to... Let me just open this up another window here. There it is. All right. So what you want to do is uh, you got your OVA file, which is a package for installing your virtual machine. So if we want to run this just as a virtual machine, like in VMware, we just double click it and add it, and that's not a big deal. Hmm. Uh, but if you want to use this in a simulation tool like uh, CML, like I'll be doing, what you want to do is you want to take it and you want to where is my struct button. Well, apparently I lost my extract button, but what we <laughs> want to do is we want to, uh, oh, seven's up here. And then we'll extract it. And inside here, we're going to have the uh, OVF. This just explains what, uh, like how big, how much RAM to use, and how much memory, that kind of stuff. Hmm. And then we have the VMDK, which is the... Um, Too, but it's bigger now. Um, but uh, and we have this as the actual hard drive file. So what I got to do is, if I'm going to use this in CML, I got to convert this. If you want to use this in uh, GNS3, then you just point it to the VMDK, and that's good enough. Okay. But okay. but CML only does um, key move files right now, so we just got to do a little bit of work here. Right. Right. So I'm just going to go to the file that I made. Aruba. And we're just going to paste that in here, and we're going to go to my WSL shell. And... All right, so here is my CM or uh, WSL shell, so I can do my Linux commands. I'm like in the background there. Solid. Yeah, yeah. I think it's <laughs> actually, just got two cats yesterday, so uh, oh, I finally got awesome. some uh, cats in the household. Congrats, awesome. Yeah, my fiance is keeping them company as we speak. Great, great. What we're going to do is we're going to use a tool, and this is called uh, Kimu IMG. We're going to go convert, and we're going to give it the format of VMDK. You can tell it where the file is, and then we're just going to rename this to be UCow2. Because, of course, we can never stay entirely on topic. We have to venture on all kinds of random tangents when we talk. <laughs> of course. But essentially, what we're doing is we're just taking this uh, format and using it in so I can uh, build a topology in a hopefully easy way fashion. Right, right. And then if you want to do uh, GNS3, basically you just point it directly to the VMDK file and you can build the topology that way. But this way is slightly more interesting and therefore more fun to watch. Always good to pick up some extra tidbits of information. Yeah, it's funny. I recorded a video on uh, how to do a wrist in CML uh, the other day. Yeah. And uh, I, uh, for whatever reason, when I was trying to record it there, I just could not say uh, Q Cow 2 Q there. Cow just, two. Uh, <laughs> Tongue twister. It just, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, there's like a, if I had like blooper reels, just be like me endlessly uh, <laughs> messing that up there over <laughs> and over. Does it take some time to uh, convert the file over? It does, because what it's doing is it's basically t changing it from uh, fin provisioning to thick provisioning. 
Oh, okay. Right, right, right. So this will end up being um, probably like five gigs or something by mm -hmm. the time it's done. Yeah. So what we'll do is we will get logged in. To my CML. And I'm connected to a bunch of VPNs. I should probably get out of there. <laughs> If anyone watching isn't aware, CML is uh, Cisco Modeling Labs. It's like Cisco's network uh, emulation it's, software. It's for their version of GNS3. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I'm assuming most of your people will be familiar with, or if they're yeah. not, it's basically the um, real version of what Packet Tracer is. Yeah, yeah. Because when you use um, Packet Tracer, you're faking networks, and this is using the real images. Yeah, so you can so see here a bunch of stuff there, like I already have um, an Aruba Lab going. But what we're just going to do is just add the new image just so we can say we did it. Yeah. And we'll just go to here. And we can see all the different images that I add. And we'll go as manage. And if this works, it's still taking time, right? Eh? All right, we'll see if this works out in a timely fashion or not, we'll pivot. Yeah. How easy is it to set up CML if people want to use it? Uh, it's actually pretty easy. Uh, they're making it easier and easier with each um, revision. There is some, um, uh, I'll call them um, misses uh, that they've done there. Like, uh, for example, I have um, this SD-WAN lab. Hmm. And like, uh, if I want to... Uh, edit my SD-WAN. Uh, we can uh, play with here on the terminal, but if I want to use my own, um, I end up writing a fairly com elaborate script to handle that there, because the way they, uh, they uh, chose to tackle that web-only issue. Hmm. And uh, so there is some complexities there, but uh, for the most part, um, uh, it's uh, pretty easy. You can actually get a, uh, up and running in probably half an hour. Okay. Not bad, not bad. Yeah. Uh, but the main thing is that uh, for the cell is that it has all the Cisco images. Yeah, exactly. So that, uh, if you don't uh, work... Oh, there we go. It's done. Nice. Uh, so if you don't work, you can um, go ahead and <laughs> use it right away there without uh, uh, doing anything uh, out of bounds or mm -hmm. uh, without having to work and get the proper licensing. So it's good for that kind of thing. It's... Uh, the min ba uh, the min version is two hundred bucks a year. Uh, it's worth it if you're um, doing any of this kind of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. If anyone studying for their CCNP, you'll definitely want to get CML for sure. So, oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, you can't. Your packet trace is good for CCNA level, but beyond that, you really should get CML. Yeah, I, I absolutely wouldn't recommend uh, people do. Um, I forgot to. Uh, I, uh, if you're thinking about once you're past your CCNA, you can pretty much uninstall um, Packet Tracer. Yeah, yeah. It's um, unless you're like helping people like Jeremy or whatever. It's um, uh, it's gonna cause you more a lot more grief than it's going to help you because it's really limited. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so we're going to upload that, and hopefully, I didn't actually see how big that file was. Well, it's not that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, decent pace. Yeah, yeah. Packet Tracer. Um, I think it's awesome that Cisco releases that for free. It's a great study tool for CCNA, but uh, yeah, very limited beyond that. Yeah. Well, the thing you got to keep in mind is uh, I'm actually working on a course for Network Jock on Packet Tracer right now. But oh, uh, awesome. We're cutting into your market, Jeremy. We're coming for you. <laughs> Darn, I can't keep up with Network Chuck. Yeah, but. Uh, <laughs> Well, Network Chuck can't keep up with Network Chuck. That's why he hired me. <laughs> right, right. True, true. But, uh, uh, yeah, but uh, the thing is that they have to fake all the commands uh, because it's not running real code. So uh, the developers have to pick what's important for people. Yeah. And that's where uh, something like uh, CML or GNS3 is a lot better because it's actually running the code there. So, um as long as the feature itself works, like it doesn't require hardware, then you can do whatever you want to do. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's taken a little bit of time. Uh, 
It's just enough time to make me question why I didn't upload this first. But, uh, <laughs> no worries. Maybe. We can wait. <laughs> uh, any questions in the meantime? Um, let me check the chat. Anyone have any questions? Okay. We got one from Ed, Practical Networking. Uh, mm -hmm. Thoughts on CML versus EVENG. What do you think about that? I hate e, uh, EVE. Um, I am no fan of it. Uh, okay. Uh, I um, got burned by buying their pro version, and uh, uh, the way they handle their licensing and whatnot is um, I feel negligent. Mm. And uh, I'll leave it there, but um, uh, let's just say uh, the owner and I have uh, had words. Okay, so not a fan of Even G. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, it's fine if you just want the basic stuff there. Uh, just to talk about it a little bit is that um, the way Even G uh, does their licensing, uh, or at least when I last looked at it, is that they think, uh, do a fingerprint based on the, um, the uh, VM uh, to generate your license. And uh, if you uh, V motion your. Uh, uh, thing or whatnot, it breaks the licensing. Oh, wow. And, and the way their policy is, at least at the time I talked to there, if you like to delete your VM, yeah. uh, they'll basically make you buy a new one there because they, uh, uh, there's no um, uh, the way they handle the licensing. So it's just, uh, I don't find it's customer friendly and the tool itself is very um, clunky with the way you have to add nodes by making folder structures and that kind of stuff. Like it's mm -hmm. um, interesting. Uh, I'd say CML is the best for um, an all-inclusive automation forward solution. Uh, and then GNS3 is fine for um, uh, a more lazy kind of simula or simulation. But uh, uh, there's no real reason to use Eve. I mean, um, right. uh, you can customize the resources and whatnot uh, um, in either other solution. But if you, want, if you do use Eve and you do like it, it doesn't really matter. Use what works for you. But... Uh, uh, you won't see me praising it unless there's uh, a massive overhaul. Right, okay. I was going to ask also CML versus GNS3, but you kind of answered that there. I mean, it's preference. I mean, uh, I'm uh, obviously a bit of a power user. Uh, right, yeah, but, uh, a bit. <laughs> so uh, someone like me and Kelvin and whatnot, they're like, we get really into the nitty gritty and uh, we can work around any limitations in CML, like um, uh, while we're waiting here. Like I wrote uh, a tool there to handle connecting there, and it's um, probably a bit unnecessarily elaborate. But if you're not comfortable doing that kind of stuff there, and you're just doing the bare bones, you you might just want to stick with GNS3. Right. And uh, a lot of people they buy CML for the images, hmm. and then they uh, go from there. But we'll probably look at this a little bit later. But here is my lab tool. Oh, just finished. Say by the goal. But um, see there, this is uh, 416 lines of code there for me to well, essentially uh, manage the lab and to connect to my secure CRT. Hmm. So uh, there is uh, there's some trade-offs for sure. Uh, but uh, in terms of like the automation platform and um, uh, some of the other stuff there, I think CML is the best investment, at least for the images. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Anyway, that's uploaded. So what we do now is go create new definition. And we'll type in Aruba. It's in the label. We don't really care. We'll pick the image. And then we're tying this to our Aruba. Oh, one, one more question from Kelvin. Uh, did it work when you re-V motioned? Uh, no. Even no, OK. Uh, uh, I think once it breaks, it breaks, and it doesn't try and recover. OK. Um, yeah, I, I actually am um, kind of mad at Keith Barker because uh, I bought uh, ePro when it first came out there, and I got that issue, and I got in a fight with uh, uh, Zed or whoever the owner is, I can't remember, and uh, and uh, I kind of let it go, like, okay, fine, and then uh, Keith said, oh, they fixed all the licensing stuff, so I bought it again, and then, <laughs> Lord and behold, uh, they did not fix the licensing stuff. Okay. So, so. <laughs> so. I think I paid about a grand for uh, testing it out there, so I think wow. I'm at my patience end. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But anyway, uh, so we just took the definition, we bind it to the main definition there. We'll have a look at what that looks like, and we'll go create definition. Oh, 
I click that. There we go. And uh, just as just case in point, you can extend these tools with whatever vendors you want. You're not stuck with. Uh, Anyway, let's go here, and we go to my Aruba, which is here. So we can see we have my node definition, and then what we do is just the skim overs. We just uh, tell it how to run it, so how much RAM to give it. Uh, we tell it uh, what the interface structure is. Mm, so you can right, see right. there's an interface, and then this is how they identify interfaces when we get in there. And then what we do is we just add a logic there so that uh, yeah, it's just going to look for this prompt. And when it does, it's going to know the node is ready. Hmm. And that should be good enough. OK, cool. All right, so, so let's try this. Uh, let's see if this works out of the gate. So we're going to name this lab Jeremy Aruba, because I am very creative. Very creative. <laughs> All right, so what we're just going to do is we're just going to do a standard Spine leaf topology, and I'll show you why I'm doing this when we get in there. So, what we're going to say is this is spine 01, 2, 3, lead 01. You, uh, have you talked about spine leaf topologies? And Actually, yes, I just did. Um, it's not on YouTube yet, it's on the uh, Teachable course. I just did a, a video on it. So oh, for those nice of you who have teacher. my yeah exactly, <laughs> for those of you who, for those of you who have the teachable course, you should know about this already. Spine leaf. And if not, then buy his course. Yeah, exactly. Or you can read my CCNA book. I talked about that too, just to show myself too. Nice. Actually, I got that recently. Um. I tried buying it off of Amazon twice, and it never got here twice. So I just gave up and bought it on uh, Kindle. Oh, okay. Yep. Good stuff, by the way. Um, for those of you studying for the CCNA, I recommend you know, a video course and books. So for books, you can get the Todd Lamley books, which uh, Donald actually helped author. So definitely check those out. All right, so this is just a basic topology. So what we have here is the spines and the leaves. And as you learn from Jeremy's course, if you watch it, is that the spine connects to the leaf. There's always one connection there. And the idea is that you always have three hops no matter where you go. Yep. We'll add external connection. Or connection. So we'll say external bridge. And we'll give it a bridge. All right, so this should be enough. Hopefully, this doesn't fall on its face. Go to use the new images. And we're going to go ahead and start. But uh, you can see the benefit of using these tools if this is new to your audience there, because you can see you can drag and drop everything. Mm. I have some uh, physical Arista, or Aruba switches right beside me, and uh, it's not quite as easy to get things cabled. Yeah, virtual is really, uh, really simple to set things up and tear it down and make changes. It's also good, of course, to get that experience on the physical equipment, but... Just for a general Yeah, I lab like to recommend uh, people uh, get at least some lab experience there because you don't necessarily want to have the first time uh, you ever work on something um, uh, and then you don't know what a console port is really because you never right. ever used it. Yeah, yeah. If someone's running this CML, like a small topology like this, on their computer, how much, what, what kind of specs do you think they would need? Well, it depends on what you're running, right? So uh, this... Uh, so uh, what I've said here is each one of these is running four gigs of RAM and two CPU. Okay. Uh, so um, that would be four, eight, sixteen, or twelve, sixteen, twenty. So twenty gigs of RAM right there. Now mm. it's not always going to use twenty gigs of RAM permanently. It's going to start up and stop and whatnot. But you'd want to at least have thirty-two gig computer. Okay. To um, do it there. 
Uh, obviously, I'm a bit of a power uh, user here, so I have a small amount of RAM. Small amount, one twenty eight, yeah. just just a bit. It's actually really funny. Is um, I'm uh, I was doing a ice course for um, a client and uh, for Todd and. Um, the uh, day before the course, there on the Saturday, my uh, computer had a RAM failure, oh. and uh, I had to um, prime ship uh, like 120 gigs of RAM there to host. All <laughs> <laughs> that was uh, uh, that was a price. Thank you, Amazon price. Prime. Yeah, but uh, let me look here. See that these are starting to boot. Yep. So this is my handy uh, CML tool that I wrote. You can see it's uh, very stylish. I'm digging and what I have is this lab connect button. And when I press this, what's going to happen is it should uh, connect um, all my nodes uh, to my secure CRT so we can use it a bit more easily. Yeah. I've uh, actually never used secure CRT. What do you think of it versus something like Putty for an emulator? Oh, it's uh, it's night and day. Like uh, I basically tell anyone who's serious about networking, you got to buy a secure CRT. All right, like, I'll get uh, on that. Yeah, like it's uh, basically if you're uh, if you do any level of networking, uh, you owe it to yourself. I've got uh, I use Super Putty, which at least has the tabs, but uh, I'll definitely look into getting secure CRT. Yeah, so uh, you got your tabs, you got your uh, session managers, uh, whatnot. Uh, you got your uh, highlighting, uh, your automation stuff, if you care about that. Right, right. But you can see here, we have our uh, switches, and then we have our physical when we get to that side of the conversation. Uh, so this is our first Aruba. Do just make, say when. Oh, it's, it looks fine to me, yeah. Okay. People in the chat, if it's too small, let us know, but it looks good to me. So we log in, and there's no password. So the first thing it's going to do is make you set a password. And we'll give this a name. So this is going to be spine one. And you can see the syntax is pretty similar so far. Just got a quick question from the chat. Can we host it in GCP? That shouldn't be a problem, right? Host CML? Uh, yep. Uh, you. The only catch is you would want to make sure you're running a nested image uh, or uh, a machine type that supports nested images because what it's doing is uh, uh, basically it is uh, CML spawning these as VMs. So it is a hypervisor. Mm. Okay, okay. So uh, you'd want to make sure you're paying, uh, you're doing a higher uh, level, and that's probably not going to be worth it. Mm. Uh, but you, uh, in theory, you could do that. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if you're going to go for that effort, um, uh, I don't think they actually have any marketplace to substitute. Yeah, I guess you'd have to do that. That's probably the best way to go if you want to do it that way. But uh, locally, doing uh, GNS3 or CML is the best way to go here. Okay. So let's cool. say we have our host name. And we're just going to go ahead and get this added in. So we're just going to take advantage of a secure here. We're just going to take advantage of the send all command feature to say log into everything. Oh, that's cool. It's a good feature. And then we'll set my password. And then what we're going to do is just say host name. And then we'll just say spine zero two. One. Backward, so let me fix that. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to do that in the real world. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> and then loop two. All right, so we have our host names. So here is why I did a spine leaf topology. 
So if I do a show interface, and we do an include like we do with uh, Cisco. You see a problem here, Jeremy? I see a lot of identical MAC addresses. Yeah, so this is why we're doing spine leaf topologies for uh, the virtual thing there, because um, uh, this is fine for routed interfaces because they, if they connect to different things, uh, then it's not going to cause an issue. Right, right. But uh, if you start having multiple uh, connections hmm. uh, between things, then uh, what's going to happen is it's going to uh, start seeing the Mac flapping and you're not actually going to work. So this right. is why, uh, uh, this is why uh, we could use our uh, physical switch here so that we can... Um, uh, get around that there because this has the actual proper MAC addresses there. So it's just a decision they made in the virtualization. Okay. And okay. Uh, I don't know why they've done it this way, but uh, in a perf like the alert two stuff actually is functional if you do it one thing at a time. It's just not, um, uh, uh, and you can't change the MAC address either. So just keep this mm -hmm. in mind if you're doing a lab. It's uh, uh, you don't want to say I want to practice spanning tree uh, in this where you're gonna have a bad day. Okay, yeah, can have a bad time. I noticed something up there. In Aruba, what do they call it? Aruba OS, is that the name? Yeah. You don't have to use, like, do to run a show command from config mode. Yeah, so that's one of the differences. So if I want to, I can do, like, show LDP, for example. Mm, nice, nice. And uh, the interfaces aren't configured yet. The other difference that you'll see is if I do, like, show interface um, brief, so what we have here is that the interfaces are not named uh, by speed like Cisco does. It's just one through whatever you have. Mm, right, right. And uh, you can see the terminology is the same. So like we have uh, uh, administrative down is the same as uh, shut down for uh, Cisco. Right. And then uh, there's a couple other differences here and there just to mess with you. So what we're going to do is we'll just get some basic routed functionality going, and then we'll turn our attention to spanning tree and stuff on the physical side. Cool. So what we'll say is interface one, and if I want to, I can do a range. So I can say four, for example. So we can do our ranges just like Cisco, except for we don't need the range command. Oh, nice. And nice. what we do here is to say no shut, but the actual command is actually, no, uh, I got ahead of myself there. So no shut to enable them. And then we're just going to do our individual configurations. So um, right now, this is a great effort. And then um, this just means it's layer three. If we didn't want to route import, we would say no routing. So pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. This is like this, this is switch port, no switch or um, switch port, no switch port. So mm -hmm. it's just inverted mm -hmm. logic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As um, Aruba and whatnot, they really hate spanning tree there. Like when you buy an HP switch, their spanning tree is disabled on it. Oh, and, disabled uh, by default. Yeah, and it's up to you to realize that's a problem and fix it. <laughs> because uh, if you just plug it in the network there. Uh, and you uh, have redundant links there, you got an instant loop. Wow. So uh, good uh, good on them there. Good, good on them, good job. <laughs> so what we're going to do is uh, we're going to go ahead and um, give an IP address. So IP address. So we can see we can do, let's say, 10, 1, 1, 1, 2, 5, 4. And I like to do a scheme when I do these labs there. So I like to do like... Uh, X, Y, so like uh, what they're connected to. So this would be uh, uh, the first uh, spine uh, switch, and then this would be the first leaf, and then uh, whatever the uh, IP is. And we can, uh, we can say we can do slash notification. And if we prefer, we can also do subnet mask. So it's really just what you prefer. OK, that's nice that you have the choice there. Yep, so you have a choice. And then uh, at this point, it's good enough for basic connectivity. Uh, we'll get routing working in a minute. And we'll add a loop back. Loop back zero. So 
So we have some routes. And what we're going to do is just work our way through this. So we'll say interface two is going to be week two. So we're going to have a nice and predictable um, IP scheme here. Yeah, it's always really helpful in labs. Have a have a logical scheme to your addressing. Makes everything yep. way easier. And then what we'll do is we'll say rotor. So again, we can have the kind of stuff you would expect here. So we have BGP, of course. We have OSPF. Uh, we do not have EIGRP because this is Cisco. Hmm. Uh, and then there's a couple other choices there. Like uh, if you know you're multicast, uh, this is under here. Uh, VRP is under here for certain things, and we have to rip if you just don't want to use that. So. Uh, the kind of stuff that you would expect there um, is under router. So we'll just say OSPF. Go to process ID. Now the first thing we want to do is we actually need to enable it. Otherwise nothing is going to work. And then we can do things like set the router ID if we want to. Um, by default just going to do the same logic as uh, Cisco and uh, we'll grab uh, uh, sorry, that's what I thought. Well, uh, we'll grab the router ID from the loopback or the highest IP. And then we can do our summary stuff. And uh, if we wanted to, we can find areas. So we can go area here, zero. And one interesting thing there is that when we enable this there, if uh, the area isn't created, it's going to prompt you. So if I go to the interface here and I say I want OSPF, and I'm going to say two area one. Say, hey, this process doesn't exist. Do you want to create it? Oh, and that's interesting. Gonna, and it's going to say, hey, this area doesn't exist. Do you want to create it? Hmm. Whereas uh, Cisco would just say, okay, you defined. I'm going to create it for you. Yeah, yeah, automatic. So I don't actually want that. I want this guy here. And you can see that it's not replacing the process there. It's um, it's uh, basically trying to add them. And this is another difference there where Cisco has more of the ISP level stuff there. So if you get really deep in OSPF, there's something called uh, uh, multi-instance uh, OSPF or multi-area. Uh, you can see here you can do multi-area, but you can't do the multi-instance. Mm. OK, OK. We can go under here and see what we have. So I'm just going to remove this. And of course, you can see the other difference is there's no network statement here. Uh, we're uh, basically just doing it from the interface config only. Okay, that's the only way you can activate OSPF on an interface? Yep, or RIP for whatever else there. There's uh, uh, there's no, um, it's all just the interface configuration. Okay, nice. So with that done, what we're going to do is just go back to our range here. And then we'll just say zero, and then we put this under our loop back zero. So the thing about having a nice templatized config is we can just go show run, and now we can just grab all our interfaces. And if I grab enough. Uh, probably too much effort, but whatever. We can grab our interfaces, and we can clean it up a bit because I had to grab a bunch of other interfaces because the virtual has a bunch of uh, interfaces by default. Mm. So now that we have this, all we do is we just customize. So this is the second spine and everything else is the same in my standard. And then this would be two. So uh, copy and paste is your friend when doing labs because it can save you a lot of typing and a lot of uh, simple mistakes when you're trying to throw this together quickly. Mm, yep, absolutely. And you can see uh, this is why you copy and paste it there, because it says, hey, uh, you never created those instances. It's prompting you. Uh, so, yeah. Yes, yes. I'm going to paste that again, because I was ruined. There we go. Then we're going to go to our leaves. And our leaves. We're not going to make the same mistake because we learn from our mistakes sometimes. <laughs> sometimes. Create it. Yeah. 
And we only need two interfaces for our leaves, so we're going to remove this. And we're going to say that this is one. One. And two. One. So you can see here that we have uh, our leaves are connecting to each spine, and then this would be 11. Copy this, paste it in. Here we just make our differences. So this is going to be 2, 2, 2. Man, outside of the interface names, it looks just like a Cisco config. Yeah, so uh, like I said, it's not going to scare you guys if you get into it um, or if you have to do it for work or whatnot. Um, uh, and that's why I always say like CCNA is always a good step uh, for most juniors because if you can learn uh, CCNA uh, and like one other way of doing things there, you can cover most of what's going to you're going to encounter in the real world. Yeah, yeah. So in a perfect world, I should be able to go show IP OSPF neighbor. And we can see that we have um, our neighbors. And you can see that uh, this guy has um, got its loopback address and these haven't. And the most likely issue is that either I haven't advertised the loopback properly or uh, the OSPF came up before the loopback was initialized and um, it was just a timing thing. Hmm. Let's see if we actually learn those routes. So we can see we have all three routes here. So this is just an um, initialization thing. So what we can do is just say clear IP OSPF. And we can go to neighbor. And we'll just say enter. We'll say yes. And we'll do the same thing here. Go over this way, we should have uh, fine I'll just do it. If they won't let me be lazy, I'll do it the other way. <laughs> so this follows the same process as Cisco like manual configuration then Highest loopback IP than highest physical interface IP? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Router, OSPF1, router ID. And it actually is best practice to set the router ID in labs there, so that's what you get for being lazy sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I do like that warning message, though. <laughs> Clearing the OSPF neighbors may result neighbors. in traffic not disrupt. <laughs> Thank you. It, it may. <laughs> there we go. All right, so you can see that um, the OSPF is basically working what you would expect to see. We have our neighbor ID, we have our neighbors, we're full state. So remember, OSPF is OSPF. Uh, if you know how it works in Cisco or Juniper, they're not going to throw a curveball here. and. A vendor is not going to say, oh, by the way, this is called active instead of full. This is the standard, and they're following it. Yeah, it's a good thing about uh, standard protocols like this. Yep. So uh, what we can do here is we can check our routing table. So this looks a little bit different, but it's the same idea. So we can see that uh, we even have the same administrative distance. This is 110, uh, which is what uh, Cisco would have. And then we can see OSPF, a route code. See, they have the legend just like with Cisco. Uh, next hop type. Wanted to, we can go and get detailed information. Now, this looks different, but uh, it's the same idea when you're doing your troubleshooting. We can also have a look at the peering. We'll have a look at this later. Uh, VRFs are supported. So, have you guys talked about VRFs yet? No, we haven't. I don't think so. Okay. No. All right. So, basically, what you can do is you can create multiple routing tables. And uh, 
this is used to segment traffic and to um, uh, it's used for a lot of advanced things there. But the main one is it lets you separate uh, uh, routing tables. So if you're doing like a carrier and you have like a bunch of uh, similar IPs, you can um, get around that, and it gives you a lot of engineering flexibility. Mm, yeah. So if you wanted to do that, you could just go IP or um, BRF, give it a name. We'll call this uh, Meow Cat because it's got a kitty. Two kitties, actually. <laughs> and uh, we give it our address family. It's just like Cisco, which I'm sure you'll talk about eventually. And basically, what we need to do here because we're not going to get advanced with uh, VPN stuff. And all we do is we just go under an interface, like four we're not using, and we just say apply. And oh, we are reference what it meant. Attack. Hmm. That was for And then it'd be Nailcat. Now, if I give this an IP address, like. Uh, we we'll get the same IP address that uh, we have on the 111 interface. See, there's no complaints here. And if I go show IP route v all VRFs, what we have here is the default run table is one thing, and the meow cat's another. So they're completely separate entities, and I can do all kinds of crazy stuff with that, but this is a bit of a teaser. Mm. Yeah, same IP address on two different interfaces on the same device. Yep, so uh, you can see how that can get uh, really handy for a number of different things. Yeah. Uh, other things that we might want to do is we might want SNMP because we're going to be adding this to a server in a minute. So just like Cisco, SNMP server community, we'll continue our Meowcat honoring. Now you see it's not asking me for the read-write stuff because it's asking me under here. Oh, okay, okay. So if I was going to say, hey, what is the access level? And here's where I say this is the read-only string. And if I want one for the read-write, if I wanted to do an access list, we would pick the access list, and we would uh, define who can use the SNP string. If we wanted to do... Uh, the traps and whatnot, we would tell it what host to send to. Uh, we would pick what traps. So just like Cisco, it's just a little bit more simplified because um, Aruba had a bit of an advantage there of coming after Cisco went through all the uh, long process of figuring things out there. So they have a bit less of the legacy bloat that Cisco had over the years. Mm, right, right. That makes sense. Cisco had a feature for something to work and... They don't remove it from the operating systems. That's why when you check a Cisco, you have like 100 options here instead of 10. <laughs> and sometimes that's good, sometimes that's not. But So that's our S and a P. If we want to create users, well, they simplify it again. So instead of username, it's just user. So we're going to get this. Uh, we already have one built, but if I wanted to say like Jeremy so you can log in. And we can say, okay, we're going to add this to a group, and it's going to be administrator. So this is the privilege 15. If I wanted to do uh, uh, like a read, write, or operator stuff, we can do that here. So they have a bit, a bit better out of the box RBAC stuff. Hmm. And then we can just go ahead and say the password is plain text. And we'll go ahead and say mail caps. So a uh, simple enough password there. Uh, AAA is on by default there because they don't have to deal with that. So it's just there. We don't need to uh, enable with new model or anything like that. Mm. So I'm doing like authentication. I can say login. And you can see this is all pretty similar to Cisco. It's pretty much exactly the same thing. Uh, so that's all good. If I wanted to do SSH, I go SSH server. And if I wanted to figure a VRF, I can. Actually, it's going to make me. So I'm just going to say this is management. We'll have a look at that in a minute. Uh, uh, this is just for um, on the virtual on there. It's going to make you use the management uh, connection. But uh, on a real switch, if I go here, SSH server. Um, 
Oh, actually, you know what? They did restrict that on the new versions. Uh, they've been going through a lot of reorg stuff there, so uh, that's just uh, some of the limitations there where the management interface is uh, preferred for a lot of things, but mm. it's fair enough. So anyway, that's SSH enabled. Uh, if you wanted to do Telnet or whatnot, I don't even think that's in this image. It's, uh, yeah, it's removed. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but fair enough. That's uh, a long time coming. Who is, we're just going to say show run, include user, or user, and we're going to include SSH and SNMP. And you can see we can't pipe, uh, you can't pipe things with Canvas Cisco there. The uh, pipe commands are much more simplified. Mm. So you can see here, it gives you some examples. So we can do include, we can do begin, we can do count or whatnot. Whereas Cisco, you can do like section and you can, uh, there. Uh, what you can do is you can chain things. So you can say like, uh, I want to include uh, op interfaces. And this, so this is a lot more like rep. Oh, OK. So yeah. it's a little better at some things, but uh, in some areas, it's not. So there's trade-offs. So like if I wanted to, I could go interface brief. I can say include up, and then I can say include. We'll say I don't know one one one. So uh, it's better in that regard because Cisco only lets you do one pipe by default, unless you do uh, some of the automation stuff we talked about last time. Hmm. But uh, you uh, have less filtering capability. So uh, tomato, tomato. Uh, what was I doing? I was making sure we got the SNMP stuff. So we're going to say include SNMP. And we're going to include uh, we'll add Jeremy just because. Actually, does it let me? No, yeah, okay. All right. <laughs> All right, so we're going to copy this and I'm going to do this a bit cleaner for copying and pasting. There. All right, we're going to copy these and we're going to paste them here. And then we'll clean up our commands. If you guys learn nothing else, there is the power of notepads. Yep, absolutely. Use them all the time. Yep. Uh, and uh, fancier editors like I use UE Studio or uh, Sublime or uh, hmm. uh, whatnot. Like uh, they give you a lot of fancy features for uh, manipulating text very quickly. Yeah. Probably spend more time working in a text editor than directly in the CLI. Oh yeah, yeah. If you ever do something like the CCI lab, there you're basically going to be writing most of your config in a notepad here. Yeah. And rather than doing anything fancy. So I should be able to go to net edits, which is a somewhat free um, this is a somewhat free um, oh, there we go. Password. a somewhat free management server up to I think it's 20 switches. Uh, where you can, or I think it's 10 switches actually, where you can do a starter pack and add switches to play with it. And then after that, you have to pay for it. But uh, if you want to throw this in the lab, uh, this does take a lot of RAM. This is 32 gigs. Mm, wow. But uh, what this does is this will uh, help you um, do some of your uh, configuration and will uh, provide some workflow. So inside here, what you want to do is you want to go to device credentials. And we're going to go ahead and add lab and we're going to go ahead and add these in and then admin all right so we have our credentials so we can do a discovery uh, first, we need to add the uh, get management connectivity, and then uh, there's one other thing I need to do. So, the management port is not listed here. You can see, this is just member ports and loopbacks. If you want to see the management port, it's actually here. 
You can see that right now it's set for DHCP mode and there's uh, no IP address information and uh, so on and so forth. So what you do is just go under the management interface and the syntax here is completely different. So rather than <laughs> have the IP address like normal, you do either DHCP or static. So I'm gonna do static here. And we're just going to say that my network is going to be one, I don't know, 51. Interesting. So it's got yeah. a different uh, syntax than the regular ones. Yeah. Different syntax, completely different routing table. This is basically in its own uh, management VRF. Mm. We'll add uh, D or DNS servers. So now if I go ping, Internet, URF management. Okay, I am not getting online there, so I might need to figure rethink this. Let me just look at what I did. All right, so management is there, bridge. I did pick bridge. So you should be okay. Oh, it is just keep configuring and we'll go back to it. So. Grab this. And we'll just put this on each of our devices. Uh, I'm already boomerang things. Uh, uh, yep. This is how easy it is to mess up things in the lab there. So, like, if you ever do want to do a troubleshooting, just throw a big lab together, and I guarantee you're going to mess something up. <laughs> Good practice. If you ever do, like, an INE troubleshooting course for, like, uh, CCIE, what they basically do is just uh, make you configure, like, all 30 nodes by hand and They'll just count, uh, expect you to screw up something <laughs> for troubleshooting lab. <laughs> Configure this lab and then fix your own mistakes. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. And <laughs> yes, <we'll... laughs> All right, so let's just see here. If I go ping. All right, something's wrong with my management switch. Shut. By the way, uh, you notice how there's no log output. Um, so we do have a terminal monitor that we can enable. Okay. Nice. But you can see that it's only supported for SSH sessions. Huh. So if you uh, are consoled in there, you're actually at a bit of a disadvantage. And then if you want to look at logs, you go show log. And see, we have a bunch of lists here. So we can look at logs in reverse order. So we do dash R. And if we want to look at uh, specify numbers, we'll say the last 10 logs. So we can uh, adjust this a little bit here. Uh, so it's just a completely different way of handling the logging than mm. everyone there. And the uh, uh, having your output is a little bit different than if you're what you're used to Cisco, where you can just treat the console the same. Yeah. So there's no way to get it to output to the console. No. Oh, okay. They decided that that is not a feature that you care to have. <laughs> <laughs> And new receive and transmit if we want LVP. And say no shut. We'll go ping. All 
All right, so this may be a problem, but not a huge deal. Um, I'll just show you the other switch if I need to. So we can see we can do our VRFs and they are uh, split up for us there. So we see the meow cat in there. Um, the management one, I don't know why. This might be a version work. Let me just go back under management here. And let me just see if I can ping this. Maybe this is working. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just correct the CML topology a little bit, and then we'll uh, switch our attention or focus our attention on the uh, physical ones. So we're not dragging things too much. <laughs> sure. That's why when you do things, it's always good to have some kind of backup. So we're going to go here, and we're going to delete this node. I'm going to add another one. All those. See if that works. I'm going to turn it on. So while we're waiting, what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at the um, physical switch, which I put over uh, here. And because this is an SSH session. We can actually just go to terminal monitor. Now we can actually see mm. things. <laughs> nice, nice. And uh, we can uh, change what the severity is. So uh, basically what this means is uh, just like Cisco there, like if we wanted to see like interfaces come up, whatnot, we want like say critical. Or if we wanted all messages, say debug. So let's just say debug for fun. Now, if I flip stuff in, like I'm going to grab this access point here. I'm going to be plugged into the first port. Oh, nice. There we go. Yeah. So you can see that our PoE is working, which is another thing you can't really lab virtually. Mm, yeah, for sure. But, uh, See that we got our info, so we can see that uh, we can use this to control what we care about. So we would say like move the severity to info, so we don't get crazy info. But what we can do here is, so this is our switch. Uh, there's not, there's like no configuration on here right now. But we can change gears a little bit. So if I want to add some VLANs. We just go VLAN, and we'll get this, uh, I'll just say 120. And this is pretty much the same as uh, what you would expect. Uh, so it's going to be flapping a lot because of uh, is not finding its controller. So we might turn this off in a minute. <laughs> but uh, what we can do here is we can say the name is going to be wireless AP. And while we're here, we'll just go ahead and say um, VLAN, let's say, I don't know, 110 would be phones, uh, 130 will be a um, guest. So we have some VLANs. Now, if I check spanning tree, this has uh, already been enabled there because uh, uh, 
would be bad otherwise. But you can see that we're running in, um, uh, we're running in MST mode, uh, which have you guys talked about yet? MST or MSTP? Yeah, I mentioned it in the spanning tree section, but I haven't actually taught MST itself. I think that's sort of well, out of the CCNA scope. <laughs> it is, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so anyway, we have our VLANs. And I actually do have... another switch here that we can connect with. So what I'm going to do is just quickly add an IP address for it. And that's doing that on another screen. Is there any questions so far? We're kind of covering a lot of random stuff so far. Uh, yeah, let me look through the chat. If you guys have any other questions, feel free to ask. Um, Looks like we covered all of them. Oh, I have, I have one from earlier in the stream. Uh, he asks, thoughts on DevNet Sandbox and its suitability for CCNP? So CCNP is kind yeah. of, there's a lot of different CCNPs, but what do you think? Uh, yes, uh, to a point. I mean, um, DevNet Sandbox, the whole point is to provide you um, uh, a programming interface uh, so you can mess, uh, mess around with a lot of Cisco products. So go on a random town here. You can go DevNet Sandbox. And you can sign in with not just your Cisco, but uh, all kinds of stuff. Because uh, it's just there. But you can see Yeah, so what you got here is uh, you can see uh, there's a bunch of um, automation-centric stuff there that uh, if you aren't in the field necessarily and you're interested in this kind of stuff, you can play around with it a bit. Like if you want to play with uh, SQN, for example, they have an always-on that you can log on and play, or you can schedule some uh, labs if you want more um, uh, hands-on time. Uh, you got like phones, for collaboration, cyber vision is IoT. Uh, firepower. So uh, I wouldn't recommend solely studying with this there because that kind of implies you're not in the field and you're really shouldn't be doing automation stuff or CCMP for that matter. But uh, in terms of just uh, filling gaps or whatnot, yeah, there's no problem with it. Uh, I don't think it has everything on the um, DevNet tracks there, but it has a good chunk. Okay, nice. Is it generally pretty easy to reserve a spot for these labs? Oh yeah, you just go like uh, pick one, like this guy, and then um, it should blow up on me. <laughs> um, once it, there we go. So basically, you just pick the time you want, and then you just go reserve. And it's going to reserve. It's going to send you an email with uh, basically the VPN um, connection. Okay. If you use access to the lab, and then uh, if you don't have any connect, I believe it gives you a link to download it, hmm. and then uh, you can go from there. But no, it's pretty painless. Uh, let's take a minute. I don't really care about this lab, but uh, uh, basically, what it's going to do is bring me into the apology view. So, you, oh, here we go. Yeah, so it's going to bring it into the topology view. And uh, now the thing about this uh, environment compared to like other things you might know, like dCloud, is that there's no real, uh, there's not a lot of guide stuff here. Like uh, they'll basically say like, how do you get on the, uh, how do you get in on the stuff there? How do you connect? And maybe one or two of them will have like uh, instructions. Like this has a lab for how to do uh, the Kubernetes stuff. Hmm. Uh, but a lot of them are just pure sandboxes where it's up to you to do what you want to do. But so this one actually has a decent written out lab, but uh, a lot of them don't. So uh, just keep that in mind. This is not meant for. Um, this is more meant for you. You already know the tool, and you're just uh, trying to apply your knowledge. This isn't really. Uh, I'm going to hold your hand through it. Mm, okay. Anyway, back to the matter at hand here. Sure. Uh, 
So, uh, what is the IP address I have on this one? Okay, so I should put this. IP static or words right. Just adding hmm. IP address on my other switch here. Okay, nice. And uh, apparently, I have to spell words right. Crazy, right? <sighs> crazy, crazy. They're so demanding. I know. <laughs> All right, user. Admin, password, someone text. All right, so I should be able to connect to H2 now. I can. All right, so we have two switches. And <laughs> We should have connectivity. So this is connecting. Okay, so this is detecting the access point and or something. Oh, that's actually something else. It's connecting a phone or something, and we can see that this is connecting my management link where my uplink switch is. Mm. And what I can do is I'm just going to make sure there's no bad configuration here. So uh, I have what's set up um, as VSF. So if I was to enable the links here, what would happen is that it would uh, form a stack. Oh, okay. Which is yeah. what we want right now. So I'm going to remove this, hopefully without causing an issue. I just caused an issue. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, my bad. So I meant to just delete the links, but whatever. Um, anyway, well, that's happening. Um, what I was going to show you is we added the uh, VLANs. And we can see there's no member ports or anything yet. So mm -hmm. we're going to go to the first port. And to make it uh, layer 2 port, we say no routing. So you can kind of see their bias towards routed ports there. They don't really like the whole VLAN thing if mm. they can help it. Right, right. And then rather than like Cisco, we would do a solo switch port access VLAN. What we do here is we just say VLAN access <laughs> and we tell it the port and we're in the port now. If we want it to be a trunk, we would just go VLAN trunk and tell it which VLANs are allowed. So we don't mm. do the and the thing there, it's just uh, we tell it directly. Okay. So now we're in the VLAN. If I go show VLAN here. So just like Cisco there, we can see that uh, the ports are added. We can see that this actual up there and uh, we can see that these can be flapping because uh, they're just access points. So if I wanted to, I can do per VLAN spanning tree. So I can go mode, I can go Rapid spanning tree. Now, unlike Cisco, there are consequences for doing this. Uh, this disables some features, whereas if you use MST, you can use all the functionality. Okay, what sort of uh, features does it disable? Well, the feature it disables is you might remember in Cisco, there's a handy tool called VTP. Mm, yep. Well, there is a uh, Aruba equivalent that is called MVRP, hmm. Multi VLAN Registration Protocol. And what you do here is that I can enable this, but if I put this to here, it's going to say, hey, oh. I can't do this. Well, this is enabled, so it's going to stop you. Okay. So if you really like the idea of um, propagating VLANs, you can do this. But it's not going to work out too well for you if you uh, do there. 
Actually, you know what? I can probably just do a quick conversion here because we don't have any loop ports. So let's just do a quick sand, uh, check here. What we're going to say is uh, actually, let's just see if these are working. Thing. Oh, it's working now. Cool. Uh, all right, so we'll just uh, ignore our physical environment for a bit there, uh, and we'll have a look at that there, and we'll add these to our network that I was going to do. But we can see where our connectivity, our magic port is going. So I should be able to ping. One five one. No, two, three. Four. Okay, so it looks like it's hit and miss. Hmm. Five. Okay, so I got a problem with one, and I got a problem with three. So let's just see if we can quickly fix that. My other switch is back from wiping itself, so that's cool. So what we can do here is just look at here and just see what the state of things are. Oh, did I not? I'm gonna show run management. Okay, so two, three, four, so for mm -hmm. some reason I lost the connection here. Oh. When I wiped it. So instead it gateway. Oh, there it is. <laughs> nice, okay. nice. Got it. Sometimes you have to help ARP along. <laughs> uh, all right, so we got our ARP, and then the only one that wasn't working was this guy. So we did the same thing. Okay, so before we lost the plot, uh, let's go back over to here. That window, I wanted the other window. There we go. So, this is NetEdit. And now that we have connectivity, I should be able to add our switches in here. And what it's going to do is it's going to let us uh, automate uh, some stuff. And uh, basically, it could be an operational dashboard. It's mm -hmm. kind of like uh, a prime infrastructure, kind of like SolarWinds, mm -hmm. uh, but more for configuration. So, if we go Discovery, And we log in. <laughs> uh, oh, not this section. I want devices. Discover devices. So, okay. okay. so from here, we give it a subnet. So that's this guy. You pick the credentials I saved. And then we got to give it some seed addresses. So this is where I tell it what IPs to connect. So 
So it's going to connect to all the devices, get their configs and such? Yeah, exactly. Nice. Uh, so there's one more thing we've got to do before we go, and that's enable the web interface so that it can do its automation stuff. So to do that, we just go to each of our switches. And we're going to say HTTP server, or HTTPS server. There we go. And we're going to say REST access mode. Read write. And then we're going to say VRF management. And that should be good. And then there's also I got it all. Let's double check here. It should be good. All right. So we're going to take those configs. And it looks like that's already there by default. Let's we'll go ahead and enter these in. All right. So I should be able to go here and go discover. And in a perfect world, oh. it's going to do that. Nice, nice. Missing a spine. Which could definitely be taken out of context. Um, mm, something up with a spine, too. All right, so let's just go ping. All right, you're on. So let's just go discover. The way they do this, I find is a little bit annoying because what this is doing is mapping the uh, credentials to the subnet. But uh, then you actually add the seed addresses there for the seed. And it's supposed to find things there, but it's not, I don't find it terribly reliable, but whatever. So let's just assume I missed that and go discover. Hmm, not finding spine two. Yeah, we'll give it a minute, see if it shows up. But uh, for our purposes, it doesn't really matter. Uh, that's the beauty of having uh, two spines and these kind of networks are. Mm, right, yeah, exactly. So we can see that it's drawing our topology as it knows it. So we know there's an extra spine out there, but it's uh, a mystery for us. But we can see it's going to draw this there, and uh, it's going to give us a number of different views so uh, we can highlight things like uh, the OSBF connections and oh, cool, uh, cool. can use that to track like hey uh, if I have VLAN 100 which which has that and of course there's no switches that have that right now and if I wanted to add the other switches I could um, then we can uh, we can do some filtering stuff but the power of this is really you just don't add that spine, do you? Can't ping <laughs> that. Hmm. You have reachability, but. Die. Okay, that's there. Okay, I did that. And then I did. All right, one last try, and then I'm moving on. It doesn't really matter. It's just bugging me. <laughs> All right. So here, lab, add, 152, add. All right, well, it's dead to me. <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, you can see uh, we have our topology, and that's cool. Um, we can see that apparently it's having a connectivity issue. So it's basically like an NMS uh, for or NPM for um, uh, monitoring things mm -hmm. here. If I do this, so that is not talking correctly. So let huh. me just it's just open working a, a second ago. Yeah. 
What? A flaky Aruba solution? <laughs> <laughs> all right, so these should all be fine. Let's go back here. Okay, whatever. Uh, so the point is that uh, it's doing its monitoring. Uh, apparently, my lab is being uncooperative. So what I'm going to do is I'm also going to add um, my uh, physical switch because that should be a bit more reliable. Hmm. And we're going to say that 10, 30, 10, 0, 24. Add credentials, add... And this is going to be 10, 30, 10 to 37, and hopefully 238. And by the way, you can also import it from a CSV to make life a little bit easier. Hmm. So my other switch is still broke at the moment, so we're just going to go discover on the first one. And oh, see nice. That. This Found it. Setting. And I'm just going to reset this guy here. See so that joins the net. Hmm. So you can see here that it is uh, starting to um, draw out the network there. So. Uh, these switches aren't uh, are my Meraki switches, and it's seeing, it's learning them for the LLTP, so it's trying to draw the topology as it understands it. Mm. So uh, that kind of stuff is useful. But uh, the main thing that we can do is if I wanted to push, let's say this leaf is behaving nicely, so I can deploy solutions. So if I want to push standard configuration like NTP. I can go ahead and do that. See, I've done this once or twice. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we can enter in uh, these templates there. We can make them too if we want to, but I can go preview. And what this is going to do is just push this configuration down. That's a nice configuration manager. Nice. Shows you the uh, differences. Yep. So this is actually, I will say, okay. And if I want to, I'm actually going to correct this because this is 11. And we'll go create. So what we're going to do this is going to valid, uh, this validates configuration to make sure that, uh, oh, look, an error. Um, so oh. I'm having some weird communication issues. So I'm going to push this to my main switch instead. So this guy here. Hmm. So if I want to, I can go deploy solutions. I can pick radius. I can pick uh, if we want to do ice or that kind of stuff. We'll, pick, we'll do NTP. And we're going to pick these guys. I can go create. Nice. Okay, so we're going to deploy. And what it's going to do is it's going to do this in a controlled fashion there. So uh, it's going to push the configuration. And if the switch loses connectivity or whatnot, it's going to try to roll back. So uh, it offers, uh, takes advantage of what's called checkpoints on uh, Aruba. Mm. So what we can do here, and this is a uh, pretty well Cisco has this too it's just not as nice so if we go to here I can say I want a checkpoint and a checkpoint and we can um, create these so and then we can roll back the configuration if um, we uh, don't like it so uh, that's how this feature does it there is that it will let you um, do your own rollback stuff, which is pretty handy. And you can do post configuration stuff, so you can how you're going to handle like timeouts and that kind of stuff. But um, we go here. We can say so. This is a this is a running. It's pushed it to this switch, and if I want to, I can roll back. It's going to remove it. 
or if I want to commit it, I like the change, I'm going to say commit, and it's just going to say, oh, apparently this is just a leap after all. Oops. <laughs> oh. But uh, basically what we should do, if I, I think that was leaf one. So if I go show run NTP, we see we now have these here. Mm. So that's one way of pushing the configuration. The other thing you can do is if you don't want the templates, I can go to crazy. Where are you? I don't know. <laughs> it's gone forever. Oh, there you go. Uh, all right. So we can pick the node we want. And we can go edit and fake. And we can do this for several groups. But uh, this is where we can edit the, we'll do this for a few switches. So we can go um, back to here. And we're just going to say, you, 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 you. Uh, we're going to do this from the device view, actually. So we're going to say, you, 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 and you. And then we can go action, edit and fake. And what we can do is we can um, basically make variables or whatnot to push configuration. So you can see we have uh, static A, B, C, D here. Oh, and cool, see cool. I can change these all at once if I wanted to. Or I could go under here. And I can change them individually. So if I wanted to add... Let's just do... What do I want to do, Jeremy? Uh, what's that mean? So I can go. Oops. Space. Loop back one. And it's going to bug you about syntax and mm. whatnot, so make sure your formatting is right. And once it does it there, go enter. It's going to help you along with what's available. So you can see, like, I. Well, IP. So notice how these are two different uh, help things there. If I go IP here, mm. yeah, this is like uh, BGP and all the prefix list, that kind of stuff. But if I do two spaces in, then it's uh, actually just the interface stuff. So I can go IP address, and we can go interface IP. And from here, we can adjust what this means, and uh, we can build this out. Uh, so it's a handy tool for uh, adding configuration. It's not the best thing in the world. You can see it's a little bit clunky in some areas, mm. but uh, it does let you handle that. Yeah, it looks, looks useful for uh, pushing out you know, mass configs. Yeah, uh, so that's basically what I want to show you for this. You can also do firmware updates and kind of stuff, but it doesn't really matter for a virtual lab. Um, uh, it's there. Uh, if you have an urban network, there's no reason not to use it. Hmm. Uh, so what we can do is we can go to the physical web interface. And this is kind of hit and miss. It's actually quite nice, but it uh, you can do some things here. So you see I have a nice dashboard. You can do firmware updates. Um, you can add VLANs if you want to. I want to add a VLAN, I can just say 300, and this is going to be the Jeremy. I can spell your name right. <laughs> uh, uh, so we can add configuration changes here. You can see we can do system staff, SNMP, um, traffic, uh, or a spanning tree. But you can see I can't do things like OSPF. Mm, so, right, uh, right, right. So you can do basic stuff here in day to day. One cool feature for an automation guy like me is we can go to analytics. And what this does is gives us, um, it lets you run Python scripts, kind of like uh, how Cisco has the event uh, embedded event manager mm. that we showed you last time. Yeah. This lets you run uh, various scripts here. So this is a system monitor script I added in. And what this does is this lets you query the uh, um, the switch for real-time data. And based on this, we can have alerting 
based on that real-time analytical data. And uh, I didn't write this, this was just system created. But, and there's a store. So I can go back to analytics here and I can go Aruba Exchange. And there's a bunch of pre-built ones or you can obviously build your own if you have the skill set. But we can look at, I thought there was one called, A row count. Here we go. Hmm. So we're going to add this guy. And this is just going to download it directly from uh, Aruba site. And if that worked out okay, I should be able to go back over here. And now we have route count monitor. So we don't need to care too much about the script, but basically what it's doing is it's querying the API for how many routes it has. <laughs> and we can see we have we can set the threshold there. So if it has uh, <laughs> like nine ninety five hundred routes, which is uh, probably <laughs> much for ten thousand routes. Yeah. Uh, but uh, just to look at this, we can go here and we can create agents. And then what we do is go create. We pick what script we want. And then I uh, would we'll just say route monitor, go create. And what it's going to do is it's going to start, uh, once this gets uh, going there, uh, when we add a bunch of routes, uh, it's going to start saying like, okay, I have five routes and we're going to start tracking this in the threshold. Mm. So uh, we'll let this run for a while, but uh, it's a handy tool for doing basic uh to advance monitoring on your switch. Mm -hmm. uh, you want to see things like POE, see things like the oh, stack, nice, and nice. App, that kind of thing. So what I'm going to do is we're going to try working with CML, and if not, we'll fall back on our hardware stuff. Uh, I've been going for about an hour and a half. Uh, any questions so far? Uh, no new ones. Guys, okay. if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Uh, so let me just go back to here. And we're going to look at a couple more things. But what we're going to do is, by the way, on the switch, if I go checkpoint and... Um, we can add these uh, add these in and what on too, but uh, uh, there is uh, some uh, they're working on feature parity for the um, uh, I forget what command I'm trying to show you, but uh, uh, there are some uh, feature differences between the virtual and the physical. The oh, Aruba okay. said they're going to have feature parity about now, but they haven't quite got there yet. Mm. So just keep in mind. But uh, oh, it'll come to me later. Uh, what else can I show you? But uh, what I was going to do is we already have the layer three working, and that's interesting and stuff. We can also do like access list and stuff if we want to, so, like access list, um, IP, uh, ACL, Meowcat, and then uh, we can enter in our entries. So we can say like permit, TCP. So uh, no real surprises here. We can have groups, uh, uh, but we would add in. You stuff uh, our, our addresses or ports, that kind of stuff, just like the Cisco, and then we would apply it. You just say any, and then enter. And then if I wanted to apply this on the interface, we would just go apply, access list, IP address, or IP uh, for IP list, and then we would add that in. And then, uh, so otherwise, uh, similar syntax, and then we pick the direction, of course, and so uh, that's the access list stuff. Uh, if you know Cisco, you're not going to be too blindsided. Um, it's the same idea where you do your source destination, that mm. kind of thing. Yeah, all looks like the others are very uh, Cisco. There's no wild cards. It's, it's slash. Uh, I, I guess I'll make that a bit more clear. Mm. Is uh, there's no wild card stuff there. So when you do permit TCP, like these are, you know, uh, host address or NAC address or subnet. Uh, yeah, so these are prefix lists or network masks there or something else, but there's no wildcard, so 
that's the Cisco concept that no one really has called uh, uh, on. So mm. just be aware of that. Uh, anyway, I was going to blow away our configuration. And we're just going to say no routing. No plug, mm. access list, okay. It is pretty good at telling you when it's angry at you, so. Uh, yeah, pretty uh, clear explanation there. All right, so no routing. So what we're gonna say is this is gonna be a VLAN trunk. Allowed VLAN is gonna be all. We're gonna create some VLAN, so we'll say 10, 20, 30, 40. Then we'll do the same thing for here. We'll just go By the way, a slight difference from Cisco there is if you remember in Cisco the VLAN is not great until you exit the VLAN. This is created right away. <laughs> Mm, right, uh, right, right. Minor difference, uh, but it could trip you up one day. Uh, so anyway, we have that. And then what we're going to do is we're going to do the same thing here. Oop. I should not have showed you that. <laughs> By the way, if you guys don't know in like Secure CRT, if you want to do sections there, you hold Alt, and that's going to follow where you're about. Us cursors if you want to copy commands. Ah, uh, that's really handy. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to look into getting secure CRT right after the stream. <laughs> yeah, uh, I do recommend it. Yeah. That. And then we'll do the same thing here. I did not see that. I should have. And we'll do leaf three. All right, so now we should have a simple switching topology. So if I go show spanning tree, you can see that spanning tree is disabled because it is by default. <laughs> so we're going to go ahead and enable that. We're going to say spanning tree. And now if we look. You can see that uh, that's all we need there because the default mode is MST. So after a minute, we should see that the root port is not the spine. It's picking some other switch. So we can change this. We go spanning tree, priority. And we can see that the default is 8, so we want a higher number. So I'm just going to say that this is 0. Is now our root switch. Uh, if we look over at our leaves and do the same thing, show the spanning. You can see that our spine one is the root, which is expected. Now, in theory, I should be able to add an SVI in this environment without causing too much grief. Let's go 10, go 10, 24, no shuts. So, same rules for Cisco. The VLAN has to be used for it to be up and that kind of stuff. <laughs> so, this should work because we don't have a redundant topology, so our MAC addresses shouldn't cause an issue. So, if I go ping to. Hmm. Uh, what I'm going to do is shut down spine, see if I can make this look better. So, throw IP and grief. Okay. 
Okay, there we go. All right, so with simple out environment, we have a simple layer two. So we have spanning tree. We just did our adjustments there, so that um, get the real estate here. So we can see that uh, everything is working the way it should. So the root is obviously there. And now this is MST. So what we would have to do is we wanted to use this. We could uh, make instances. So we could say instance, and it would say like one, for example, and we would tell it which VLANs are part of that instance. And then we can have different routes. Well, now we don't need to get too much into that. But what I want to show you is the MVRP. All we do is we enable it globally. <laughs> And then, in fact, uh, put on all the switches. And then we're just going to say MVRP. We enable it on the interface. And at this point, the VLANs are replicated. If I go show MVRP and the status or state, if I can type. So you can see that it's monitoring the state. If I go config, see that's enabled. So at this point, if I go VLAN 50, and I'm going to say name test, we should see. Is that VLAN hmm. 50 is learned, but it's dynamic. Oh, OK, interesting. Now, here's where it falls down a little bit. So if I want to do like a VLAN 50, it's saying, hey, you can't create an SVI. That's a dynamic VLAN. What are you doing, you fool? So uh, if you actually want to add SVIs there, you have to actually add VLAN 50 on it here. So all the MVRP does for you is it just solves the uh, reachability black holes. Mm. Uh, it just plots the VLAN, so it's going to make sure that you have your spanning tree and your this and that there, but it's not actually going to let you do any VLAN configuration. Okay. Interesting. So that's something to keep in mind. Yeah. Um, so that's that. Um, now, uh, what we're going to do is we're just going to take off our MPRP. And then we say new MVRP. And we're going to go to curve a VLAN spanning tree just so we can see our more standard one. <laughs> we'll say spanning tree mode RP. And now if we go show spanning tree VLAN 10, you can see that we don't have spanning tree running anymore because we need to do this individually per VLAN. So on Cisco, what we could do is so you can just say, OK, well, we're just going to make sure that it's running on all the things. We'd say up to 4,094. But you see, at least one VLAN is not found, so it's not doing it. So what mm -hmm. you need to do is you need to manually add each um, VLAN here. Mm. So we'll say 10, 20, 30, 40, and so on. So a bit less friendly. They don't really want you to use this mode. Uh, they want you to use uh, MST or nothing. But now it's working just like you would expect with Cisco there. So if I wanted to have VLAN 10 be the root, we just set the priority. Want to do port uh, priorities, all kind of stuff, and cost, we can do that too. Uh, same idea, so I go under an interface, I can say spanning tree, VLAN 10, I can say cost is whatever, and we can adjust the traffic if we want to. Uh, you can see the cost is the new cost by default, not the old cost, so mm. it's like 20,000 instead of the, um, the older values. Right. On that, that spanning tree. So what we'll do is look at a couple other things there before we wrap up. Sure. So what we can say is we're going to change our topology a bit. We are going to add a server. Actually, you know what? I'm going to add. Another switch. Set. Call this host. Okay. 
Connect to port five. Say port one and port five. And we'll say port one or port two and port five. Now this is more of a server scenario. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna try and get LACP working between these two hosts. Uh, so this is what we uh, and this is for the uh, VPC. Mm, right, right. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna go here and I just wanna make sure I'm running the image. I really should have deleted the other one, but here we are. And we're gonna start. And that's gonna take a minute. And while we're doing that, we're just gonna get ready. So we're gonna go here. And we're gonna use a feature called VSX, which is the virtual switch extension. And what this does is basically mirrors the control plane uh, between these switches so that uh, they can pretend to be uh, the same port channel and a couple other features. Hmm. Oh, what we can do is we first want to tell it to keep alive parameters. And we're going to say the peer is going to be is 154. The source is. And BRF is going to be management. Basically, we have a keep alive peer so that it knows that it's working. And then we can do a couple of things here. We can say that we want to do our enter network switch link. And I'm going to get this connection. I meant to bring this back up. We're going to give this another dedicated connection. So we're going to say that for six and for seven. Our interlinks. By the way, this is one major improvement from CML from the first crack at a viral because viral didn't let you um, hot add links. You had to shut down the topology. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> so uh, uh, we lost some features that the Cisco is working on bringing back there, but uh, all in all, the hot swap is a godsend feature. Hmm. So what we're going to do is we're going to go interface six. Oops. I mean, to... and we're just going to say no routing. We can go channel. And we can go. Uh, actually, I don't need to do a port channel for this. I'm just going to say, leave it at that. And then seven will be no revenue as well. And then we're just going to say six and seven, no routing. <laughs> Shut. Right, back to BSX. All right, so we did the keep alive on one side, and now we're just going to tell it to use port six as the um, enter switch link, and this is where all the data is synced. And then we have a couple other things here. We can say that what role is this? So this is going to be the primary, because there's a primary and a secondary for these things. We can say the BSS sync. And we tell it what we want to sync here. So we can sync AAA parameters, we can sync uh, uh, static routes, that kind of thing. So we need to say things like we'll do the global configuration, we will do BRRP, BRRP, we can do time. It should basically we pick all the features that we want to sync, and these are individual, there's no all button here. Uh, 
So uh, you want to make sure that you're copying stuff you want to copy. Hmm. And then we'll say SMP is good. Uh, keychain. You get the idea. Uh, so now that that's done, we can go config sync. And we'll go enable. And we can have, decide how we're going to handle this with a couple of other options, but uh, we should be okay here. So what we're going to do is we're going to go show run or show VSX status. So you can see that this side's good and the other side isn't because we haven't done anything. So we're going to go show run VSX. By the way, there's no section, but you can enter the feature name here and it's going to just filter all the information for you. Mm, nice. So I can just copy this, paste this here. And what we're going to say is this is secondary. This is the opposite of what we have. And if I go back here, so we can see it sees it and it is talking properly. At this point, what I could actually do is I can now go show VLAN and see how there's VSX peer. Hmm. Yeah. I can now do show run. Uh, oh, it's not ready yet. <laughs> but uh, what it can do is it can basically reach across the switch there and you can see the differences. And this is useful for configuration that is synced, but is not present on the switch there. So it's a little bit annoying because like the VLAN there, it's there, but it's not. So mm -hmm. it can lead right, to some right. difficulties, but. Yes. But essentially now what I can do when this is working up is let's just give me configuration. I'll give that a minute. Uh, so what we can do is we can go interface lag. Give this a lag. We'll say ten. And what we say here is the information we need. Now we should be able to go to our interface and we want to say that this is lag and this is a lag. And what will happen here when we set up the other side there is that uh, it's going to uh, treat them as one switch and then uh, we should have a port channel there. But this is a way of uh, doing uh, the data center side redundancy and then the VSF uh, that we have here for the switch um, stacking is meant for the access switches. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Uh, let's just see here. We'll go to show MSP. Are you happy yet? We'll say that we want All right. So if I go show VLAN VSX here, okay. Mm, nice, nice. So now that that's synced up. So if I was to add say VLAN fifty. You can see that that exists in the peer state. But it's not here. And if we were to check the 
consistency. It's going to flag that uh, that there's a difference. And so we have to maintain this. It's just going to try and help us out on certain things. So mm -hmm. when we go to like our VSX config here, uh, we can say we want our... Actually, you know what? It's not here. It would be under... So here mm. is where we could see that lands. Sync lands and so on and so forth. Yeah. So this is done by the actual pure land. So uh, the configuration could be a little bit more graceful, but it is what it is. But the idea here is you can be flexible what lengths you want to sync things through. US. Great limit. Yeah, what we can do is uh, just copy this. It's here, so there's no problems. Sorry, down the primary. Uh, fair enough. So uh, that way, if I do VLAN 70, we'll see here as we look at the peer, we have 70. I look at the consistency uh, it's one of those things there where the VLAN is known but it's uh, what we want to do is we, if we wanted to use it we'd have to create it locally there so it kind of helps mm. out but it's not it's massively useful there. right and if we go under our leg I think there's one other thing I need I'm like forgetting something, but I think we're okay. So we're going to connect to this guy. Is this ready? And I can't be annoyed to change this around too much. So we're just going to say host name, host, oh, interface. No routing. VLAN trunk all. Then we'll say lag 10. And no sets. In a way, our lags are different. Instead of be for channel, what's lag, but same idea. Mm. Uh, yeah. Once work and networking, you know, the, the aggregation stuff is different for platform, but they all mean the same thing, basically. And I, if I go, oh, not here. Sky, there we go. I go show leg. Show leg. Let's see that's down, so it's going to go in. Leg 10, no shuts. In leg 10, no shuts. And I forgot to enable OACP on here. That real quick. Minor difference, but you can change the mode uh, dynamically there. On Cisco, once you create it, you have to delete it if you get it wrong. Not what that mm. happens too much. But, uh, it is a difference. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then... 
we go to here. Back over to this guy. We're just going to say LACP mode activated. I'll get that a minute. I have a feeling I forgot something in the uh, work configuration, but that's the gist of what we want to do uh, for the VSX. VSX. By the way, you can type list, and it's going to list all the possible commands there if you want to have a, a look. Oh, you can also do show run, which is standard, but you can also do current context. Mm. And what this is going to do is just show you the running configuration for where you are. So that's quite handy. Uh, so spare me one sec here. Uh, any questions so far? Uh, nothing in the comments. Looks like we're all good. This uh, VSX is uh, definitely a more advanced concept for uh, those studying for the CCNA, but um, definitely something you yeah. should look into or read up on. I figured it may as well show it while it's here there. Yeah, just exactly. To show this stuff exists. Yeah. Um, let me just. There should be a command to enable. I'm just forgetting. They'll come to me in a minute. But uh, is there anything you wanted to see, Jeremy? Or anything you're curious about? Mm, on the Aruba switches? Yeah, in general. Hmm. I think we covered most of the basics. Like, I'm just uh, surprised by how, like, Cisco-like it is. I feel like someone could just jump right into Aruba and using the context-sensitive help kind of figure everything out on their own. Which is, yeah, uh, uh, they... Yeah, they should have a pretty decent idea there. Yeah, which is nice. Um, yeah, you don't have to uh, learn anything from zero. Not, sorry. So it's kind of a configuration trap. So what I did is I created a lag. But what I meant to do is multi-chassis. Multi that's what uh, I saw. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew it would come to me. So uh, there's just some slight quirks there with all platforms that you just got to be aware of. So if I go no... Oh, oops. Okay, well, that got... Uh, let me do some cleanup here, because when I was doing some troubleshooting, I actually made the lag uh, the wrong link. So let's just remove that. But you're not currently... Yes, that's... No, intercept link, lag... Oh, come on. You can see it, so it gets a little bit frustrating if you're... Mm. <laughs> All right. Oh, come on. Um... Okay. Enter switch lag is port six. Yeah, it's better. Mm, yeah, not, not, not the uh, smoothest process to go back and correct it. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, if you ever want to learn something, just uh, do like a demonstration to someone, even if it's just like a couple <laughs> people. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Something will go awry for sure.
All right, so let's just go show status. Okay, we're fine. Let's see if this is working. Show VLAN. Okay, so that's going to be upset for a minute. Anyway, we'll just get this ready. So we're going to say interface VLAN. It won't be long. Um, lag. I'm just going to delete this. So no lag 10. Okay. We're going to say interface lag 10. Oh, do not hit enter. <laughs> do not hit enter. Or do we? <laughs> Multi. There we go. Nice. There we go. All right, so this is what I meant to do, and this tells it that it's going to be using the uh, feature so that it's going to look across the for the peer. So this is where we do like our no routing, and we do a description like it's it is let's call it. All right, so now that that's done, let's see if this is happy again. It's still recovering. But what do, what we'll find is we'll clean up this side. So we'll say no and like 10. Show VSX. And what it's going to do when it gets itself sorted out there is that we should see that our interface comes up, our, our lag between the two. And this is how we do things in the data center where we, because uh, we don't do stacking in the data center for a number of reasons, we do dedicate the switch with uh, your own control plane server because we want to be very sure what happens if a uh, switch fails. Mm, right. So we'll just go recording. If this is working yet, VLAN, not quite yet. Mm. Takes about guess 10 minutes or so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Still no remote peer yet. Not yet. Soon. <laughs> <laughs> Took about a minute last time. Yeah. Uh, let's just do... In sync, secondary, okay. Never found legs, one. All right. You say mm. you're in sync. Number of leg interfaces, zero. Uh, let's just go keep alive. Okay, right, so we should be okay here. Anyway, if we look over here, what we should see is at least one of them will be up. Should be up. Hmm. 
All right, so the interest set length is six. Primary, let's sinking. We have one multi check. Active. I'm gonna see what I can do to help speed this along mm -hmm. more. And then we're just going to paste this here. Mince. Oh, <laughs> the uh, the lag is down. That's why. Oh. Because uh, it's shut down by default, speaking of differences. Right, okay. Right. That'll do it. <laughs> hmm. Alright, then it stays up, this is down, so it'll eventually come up there. I don't really care if it does or not, we're just... Uh, but that's uh, what the actual configuration looks like. Hmm. And eventually... And I might have to reboot these things because I don't think the virtual like the fact I messed up the uh, intersite link. Mm -hmm. But uh, actually, you know what? Let me just see. Okay, it's up. Yeah, it's up. By the way, we have our LDD stuff like Cisco, obviously. Uh, uh, this might surprise you. Oh. Oh, CDP. Yep. So uh, whenever they say like CDP Cisco proprietary, it's like, oh, that's nice. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, so uh, Aruba does have that. You can actually advertise CDP. Wow. And uh, so uh, they do that for a number of different reasons, but uh, they do support it. All right. I'm going to try this one last time to see if the sync is happy. Yeah. So what we're going to do is... going to reboot these switches. Now, how do you think we re reboot these? Reload. Nope. So what you do is you say boot system. And on the physical switch, you pick the primary and secondary for uh, what partition you have. So you go mm. boot system, and you do primary, secondary, or service OS as guide for you. Mm -hmm. uh, over here, there's also a couple other things we can. Do. So over here, there's also the diagnostics. And what you do here is you enable it, and then this is all the test commands that Cisco has. So like you check like cables, and um, you can do things like packet captures and oh, cool, um, cool. that kind of stuff. If you need to get into it, we can go utilities, and we have uh, T Shark, which is Wireshark. We can do SMP. We can uh, check processes. We can. Uh, Look at the actual Linux side of things, like tool, uh, how the adapters work. We do a TCP dump. We can also go into the shell if we want to. Um, so just like guest shell, uh, we can get to the actual Linux. We have a need to. Mm -hmm. uh, the difference is that the guest shell is an isolated shell you can blow up. This is the actual operating system of the thing, so you don't want to mess around and install things on here because you mm. might break your switch. Right, right. But that stuff is there. Let's just see if this... Oh, I thought this was rebooting it. I think it was asking me for confirmation. Let's reboot this guy too. <laughs> and we'll just see if this comes up, and if not, then we'll just uh, move into closing, I guess. Sure. But, but, uh, so even... This is joy. Even yep. commands like uh, write memory and stuff, you don't need to use do. So there is no like do command on Aruba? No, uh, it's basically um, 
it's all one interpreter basically okay so cool. For better or worse, uh, sometimes it is good and sometimes it's not. It really depends on uh, your perspective on things. Mm, right. Um, like sometimes do is good. Uh, it's usually annoying there, but uh, uh, there are some commands there where uh, you kind of get, you know, like in the ASA, how sometimes you get lost in the context because uh, you can uh, actually enter any command anywhere. Mm, yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's kind of like that, but uh, it's not too bad. I generally prefer the... Uh, lack of do hmm. but uh, uh, oh, I've been so used to it after the past like 15 20 years <laughs> that it's, it's kind of burned into me yeah uh, yeah a lot of the commands are very similar um, there's a few changes here and there but uh, nothing that's um, nothing that's too crazy um, hmm. but uh, yeah that's uh, the bulk with there. We'll just see if this. Cannot process reboot request. Thanks, guys. <laughs> uh, well, it is a virtual machine, so let me just see if that fixed my issue or not. Here, unreal. Nope, you're reachable. Okay. Okay, so you are rebooting. Oh, there you are. Hey, you know what I'm going to do, just to wrap up, is we're going to go here. And we're just going to say stop. Stop. Start. Hmm. Start. It is yep. not the boss of me. <laughs> uh... Yeah, so that's uh, that's the bulk of it. There, a lot of features aren't crazy. Like you have your route maps and stuff for mm. more advanced events. Um, yeah, yeah. If we do this again, I will, uh, in a timely fashion, I'll show you um, how like the uh, clear pass works, like the security stuff. Sure. If you want to get more into security. Uh, wireless is an obvious one. We can show you how the wireless works. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, I'm going to be moving on to the wireless part of my CCNA course, so it would actually be cool to see the uh, Aruba wireless after that. Okay, cool. Yeah, uh, I'm. Uh, I owe uh, Keith Barker a video on how to do uh, Cisco wireless there, so we can always do some. Um, uh, we can always meet up and do the, the Cisco side too, if you want to see like the nine eight hundreds or the yeah the sure. DLC, I have all that stuff here. Sure, sounds good. Uh, but um, yeah, so yeah, so uh, what we can do is. Um, uh, what's my train of thought out of it? Oh, I was going to show you is the uh, checkpoints. Mm, so right, what right. You can do is um, you can have uh, the checkpoints created. Uh, I always get the mode wrong. See, so, yeah, stuff like that there where the do is uh, sometimes uh, beneficial because, mm -hmm. like, uh, if they have the same command, which is bad. It's bad form, but Cisco does it too. But like, uh, you should really not have the same command on different structures if they do different things. Uh, but, yeah, definitely. So auto, and you can say like, hey, we're going to create um, a checkpoint every, let's say, ten minutes. And what that's going to do is um, uh, it's going to create um, uh, rollbacks. So if I go like copy. Run config. We can actually do this too if uh, you're used to this from Cisco. It's the same thing. But what we can do is we can copy this to a checkpoint. And I can call this Jeremy. I can spell. <laughs> oh. Copy. Oh, uh, I need to change something. So let's just say loopback 99. Mm, I see. Now, yeah. yeah. So uh, basically what this does is this saves the system stage. Cisco has this too with the uh, config archives. Mm. And what we can do is um, I go checkpoint and let's just say I delete the back 99. 
it's a real pet peeve of mine there where you do like L for loop that because of New San Francisco there, but because lag is uh, the same interface. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd have to get used to that. <laughs> 99. So that's gone. So what I can do is I can go checkpoint, diff, and we can compare Jeremy with the running config. And we can see the difference is that uh, loopback99 has been deleted. Mm. Uh, so if I want to, I can go checkpoint, rollback, and Jeremy. And as you might expect, it's going to basically just put that configuration back, and we should see the message here that loopback uh, here is here. Nice. So that will copy it to the running config? Yep. Okay, cool. So in Cisco, this is done with the config archive. This is just called checkpoint here. Mm. And you can have, just like Cisco, you can have this done, uh, do it every 10 minutes or so on some kind of logic. Yeah. Cool. That's a handy feature. All right. So let's just see if this is behaving. Now there'll have to be a chibi continued feature there because I'm not dragging this out for PSX. <laughs> so. Uh, so let's just say status. In sync operational, looking good, hopefully. All right, so let's just try our command. <laughs> Already yes. Whatever, I broke it. Uh, <laughs> that's fine. Um, uh, keep in mind, these are VMs. You can't break them. Uh, and your audience probably isn't going to be playing this feature too much anyway. Unless mm, yeah, uh, not yet. We're into the weeds, but um, uh, I can see it. I broke it. Um, but yeah, so uh, it's pretty similar. Uh, when you get into things like the radius and whatnot, I find that it's um, a bit more annoying because uh, rather than like the structure commands, uh, uh, it's actually kind of funny actually, I'll show you real quick. Uh, when you type out everything there, they opted for one long command. So you like add in all the information for your clear pass information. Oh. And uh, you get like this like three line command there that you have to maintain. and. No, I'm not the huge fan of that, but they have some mm. nice things. Like uh, the actual switch, they have um, Bluetooth uh, built in. So uh, rather, they give you a Bluetooth adapter so you can connect to your console port. Okay, that that's cool. Hmm. Uh, Interesting. You, uh, the uh, net edit is uh, not the best tool in the world, but it's okay. It looks handy. It looks have, mm, useful. Yeah, and then there's Central, which uh, is this registered for Central? Yeah, so there is um, there is a weird bug in the new code there where DNS does not work. Uh, so like, if I try to ping this, it resolves, but it will not um, it will not uh, actually be able to use that data. Uh, I confirmed that it's it's uh, the 1006 code works just fine and mm. 1007 doesn't. So I'm actually on the call on a phone with um, the engineering team and they're trying to make me a patch. Okay. Uh, so if you ping that, kind of important. Yeah. <laughs> if you ping that IP directly, it'll work, right? Yeah. So okay. the actual ping. Yeah. It's just. Uh, it's just when it resolves mm. to DNS, it will not work, and okay. it's a version thing. Um, there, uh, yeah, so uh, this is an issue because Central needs DNS to work. Uh, ClearPass, for some of its more advanced features, needs DNS to work. Mm. And it's just like, uh, yeah, you guys should probably fix that. Yeah, but, probably. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'll show you that next time if you guys are interested, if it fits in. Uh, we'll probably, talk, if we're talking about wireless next time, then I'll just show you the wireless Central because it's just good enough. Mm, sure. But uh, uh, what you can do is. Um, uh, actually, I can show you this one side. Okay. Let me just open up this. Ruba Central. Agent, my email. And what you basically do is you make. Um, 
templates that you can push uh, remotely. So hmm. um, if we go to the switch here, this is my central, and uh, if I look at switches. Uh, this guy. You can see that uh, we have the stack there. It hasn't been seen in uh, a week or two since I downgraded or mm. upgraded it again. But um, if we click on here, yeah, we get all the information of what the switch was. If I want to, I can go back out here to device and configuration. And how this works is I define all the variables I want. And then um, I, where is my template? Where's the variable? How would you use net edit versus central? Like what are the use cases? Okay, fair enough. So central is kind of like miraculifying your environment. Okay. Mm. So uh, the idea is you make your templates and you would manage everything online. Mm. So you can see like uh, you can see all the information and the VLANs I had. Well, I guess I had no VLANs at the time, but uh, you can basically manage everything uh, from here. Right. NetEdit is a, a, a server and it's meant for uh, it's meant for adding workflow into your configuration. So you can have it so that uh, uh, you make the workflow, and then um, let's say I'm more senior than you, then um, I would maybe approve your workflow, and then um, it would go for there. Okay, yeah. I don't understand why it's not showing me the... Oh, you know what? It's because that's why I'm in the wrong view. There we go. So here's the template. And basically, what you do is uh, you define um, basically you define like a Jenga template. So you would say like uh, you would define the VLANs and the other page, and then these would be applied, yeah. and you would push this down. If you don't want to do this, then you can also do um, more traditional way of doing things, which is where you actually configure things from like the web interface in Central. So if I wanted to, I could edit this. It's not online, obviously, but uh, I could uh, change. Uh, I can change VLANs and access policies stuff for here. Mm. So it's basically just like doing the Meraki side of things. Nice, nice. Have you worked with Meraki? Have you guys done it yet? I haven't, but I'm actually just changing positions within my company, and we will. I will be working on Meraki soon, so I'll have to learn it. Okay. Yeah, I've always meant to be make a Meraki video because I have all the stuff here, mm. but. Um, yeah, maybe one day uh, we'll uh, talk about it. But uh, sure. you can see you can uh, you can customize uh, the basic stuff. Again, this is just like the web interface there. So you can see like there's no OSPF or anything here. Hmm. Yeah. And, uh, the reason for that is um, you need to um, basically use the templates if you want to use the advanced thing. I don't know why they refuse to do that, but it's just one of those quirks. Hmm. But uh, you can do your customization from here. Uh, I'll get it live next time if you guys want to see it. Sure. Go on the CX side. Set the device password. So this is the slightly newer way of doing things. So uh, this is for the CX there. So we can see that we can do uh, basically the same kind of stuff. It's still static routing and whatnot, but uh, you can do like VRFs. Um, yeah, if you want to add VLANs, you can go ahead and add a VLAN. So uh, mm. uh, it's functional. Um, uh, it. Uh, oh, by the way, one minor change you guys might appreciate before we wrap up here. That's one last time. Not giving up. <laughs> hey. <laughs> oh, nice. Right, it wasn't broken. See if this Let's see if this actually works there, and I'll show you what I meant to show you. I meant that as a joke, but <laughs> it's not if it works. Uh, all right, so we see if we go brief. All 
Okay, so I'm not actually sure if this platform, the virtual platform, works for MLEG, so I'm not too concerned about this, but uh, in theory, what would happen here is that because of the multi-chassis, it would uh, bring it up there, but uh, I'll, I'll answer that next time I talk to you, but uh, sure. uh, at least it's synced. I didn't break it. Uh, what I was actually going to show you was um, voice feelings. Mm, right. So ordinarily, we would do... Uh, switch port, voice VLAN, and we would do it that way. Yeah, on Cisco, yeah. Uh, yeah, how we would do it here is we define the VLAN, let's just say 20, we'll say phones, and then we tell it that uh, it's voice. Voice, interesting. So that's how that's done. Yeah. How do you assign that, how do you assign that to an interface then? Just same way as uh, you usual? Don't, uh, it's done by LLDP. Oh, so, okay, uh, yeah. Uh, when it detects the LODP or CDP med, hmm. or LODP med or the CDP, it will automatically detect that it needs to put in the voice VLAN. Okay, cool. It's easy. If you uh, have phones that can't do that, then you would basically just assign it as the access port. Hmm. And uh, yeah, because you can't use the voice VLAN properly anyway. Hmm. Right. I think that is about it. And if there's any questions, I'll be happy to ask them, or if you want to talk about something else for a little bit. Uh, looks it's about under three hours. Good. Looks like, yeah, <laughs> I think last time we were about three hours. Yeah, that seems to be. Uh, nice. I never shut up, so if you, unless you stop me, I ah, no, no worries. I got the stamina. <laughs> More content. Cool. Anyone have any questions about uh, Aruba or? Or anything else in general? Yeah. Do you think people should look into learning Aruba or sort of leave it to if they have to do it for their job or what do you think? Um, I would wait for the job. Like uh, I've done all the Aruba certs. Like, um, let's see if I can easily show you or go to the camera. But uh, let me see you one sec here. Mm, sure. uh, get you digital editions. So. Like I have, uh, I went for all the Aruba books. Mm. So yep. see like a associate uh, professional expert is what I'm kind of working on now, which I like their CCIE. Okay. Uh, but uh, if we open like these books, um, I have the physical ones too, because I prefer physical, but uh, you can, um, you know, like things like the VSX we talked about. Mm. Uh, that's in here. Uh, uh, this is the CCMP level, so let me just look at the um, uh, one thing. Oh, um, one thing there is that uh, for one, if you choose to do this, uh, you got to remember that you're not necessarily going to get brownie points because this is very um, the certification program is much smaller than Cisco hmm. uh, because. Uh, yeah, it'd be broken. The virtual, uh, the tool they use for this kind of sucks, by the way. Uh, <laughs> so I like tro uh, the real books, but um, hmm. whatever. We'll just look at the professional one. But um, you can buy the books. Uh, let me just try this one time. Okay. Whatever, show the professionals. Oh, um, <laughs> but uh, the point is that uh, you can get these books. I find the books cover about 70% of the actual exam. So uh, if you're thinking you can read the book and uh, pass the exam, probably not. They hit pretty hard. Mm. And uh, they don't necessarily stay in the lines. Right. So uh, uh, you'll. Uh, you definitely want to make sure that you um, work with this stuff a lot. Um, like there's an edit, for example, to show you uh, what it's used for and what the workflow is, that kind of stuff. Hmm. Uh, there's a practice test. Uh, in terms of, like, uh, if you do it for work, obviously that's one thing. Uh, uh, I wouldn't recommend just doing this just for fun. Um, if you have money to burn and you think it's neat, by all means, I don't really care. Uh, you can do what you want to do, but uh, 
it was probably not going to lead to a job if you're um, uh, if you're um, I'll put it this way uh, I guess there's two answers to that question uh, if you're a CCNA and you want to expand a little bit sure just keep in mind it's probably not going to help you too much and the more search you get as a junior the more harder time you have because you have to defend more potentially in the end of you mm, right right as I mean is that like uh, uh, if Someone like me interview, or interviews you, that could be a nightmare because I know pretty much most of the vendors out there. Yeah, <laughs> so, so you can ask the hard questions. Yeah, so if I see an Aruba switch uh, uh, cert on there, or I can be like, oh, well, well, well tell me about net edits. And uh, you better be ready to say, like, oh, it's this tool rather than, <laughs> you know, I took the exam like two years ago. I don't remember. So I like, guess not going to go. <laughs> right, then don't put on your resume. <laughs> yeah, if you're. If you're gonna do the certs, like make sure you keep them active and you mean it. Yeah. Uh, if you're not a CCNA, then I wouldn't do any of these other smaller vendors unless you have like a really good reason to, like your work needs you to. Mm. Uh, do the CCNA first there, because um, a lot of these don't really hold your hand too well, mm. and uh, like uh, they'll cover like advanced OSPF is here. It's actually kind of funny. Advanced uh, OSPF in the first section, basically. Right, basically. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, uh, yeah, so basically just saying, like, hey, you should know this already. And then they're uh, diving into the advanced stuff. But, um, yeah, so uh, CCNA is always a good foundation. Um, if you're working with Aruba or your work's getting Aruba equipment, go for it. The third is there's not a lot of content out there. Uh, I've been talking with um, some people about possibly uh, – making a Ruba course there because I find that a lot of these niche vendors don't really have any mm. representation. Yeah. There's yeah. a decent uh, business model. Uh, but uh, uh, I have more ideas and time, so we'll see what happens. <laughs> That's always a problem. But, uh, yeah, what you can do is you can go... Uh, where's my window? You can search for the... ACSA Aruba. Uh, Aruba Network. <laughs> it really sucks how they name themselves after a country. Yeah, yeah, it kind of confuses the Google search. All right, so data sheet. So if you look at the first level, what you'll find is that these aren't quite aligned with what you would expect with the CCNA. So we can see here that uh, details, description. Uh, I want the topics. Can we go topics? No, not the study mm. guide. Uh, let's try that again. <laughs> HP has the worst site in existence. <laughs> <laughs> Even if you know exactly what you're looking for, you'll probably not find it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I want exam details. Not I can run to my bookshelf and grab it. Oh, there you go. Objectives. Okay. Uh, there we go. So what we have here. So um, break up to ten. Is it even a live stream with me if I don't break out my pen at some point? <laughs> all right so you can see that we have our standard stuff there so you know we have our osi model it's pretty straightforward our ospf so it's pretty straightforward the ccna uh so all this is pretty close to what you would expect for the ccna mm, yeah. ms tp is obviously new right. and vsf is a uh, proprietary to aruba so that's new obviously mm. and then um uh, they really want, unlike Cisco, uh, they really want you to know the Aruba product lines. So uh, Cisco tries to shy away from the hardware questions. Mm. Aruba loves the hardware questions. So it's going to ask you, like, what models, uh, switches should you use, that kind of thing. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Got to uh, really know the product uh, line. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's going to ask you about ClearPass, whether it's on the exam or not. It's like, uh, uh, hey, you know how to do this, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, um so uh, then it's going to make sure things like, uh, you know, can you uh, 
Uh, basically, the Aruba always has the awareness there that there's probably going to be like wireless and stuff in there, so it's going to butt itself in. It's going to make sure that you know, like your spanning tree, your uh, static across your OSBF is the same as OSB or Cisco NetEdit. It's going to make you different servers. So, if you want to study this, you're going to have to uh, uh, build that server, which uh, can be uh, pretty expensive in resources because 32 gigs. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, you have your VSF, you have your Ruba tools, um, yeah, your routing stuff. Um, it's all in all the pretty tough but fair exams. Like, uh, you're going to make sure you can do administrative tasks there, and this is where they get you. Like, can you actually add VLANs and add new devices? Uh, can you do network management stuff? Uh, so, uh, um, I mean, it's not a bad exam. It's just uh, I would wait for someone to make a decent course on it there, whether it's me or, uh, well, frankly, it's going to be me at this point. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see anyone else racing for it, but um, uh, maybe Jeremy and I would do a collaboration. But, awesome. Uh, yeah, but, uh, yeah, uh, it's uh, it's worth a look. It's just keep in mind it's not going to change your life. Mm. It's... Um, uh, it's going to be you're going to find that it's, you're going to be applying a lot of Cisco concepts if you do it but it's just going to be uh, a lot of um, uh, I would expect I'll put it this way, I don't expect to fail the exam a couple times. Hmm, it's a tough one Yeah, it's yeah. a tough one and doesn't always fall like uh, Cisco there like uh, the exam is pretty much in parity with the uh, uh, with the uh, exam topics right. this one there is like uh, yeah, but we're going to ask you about, uh, <laughs> like, uh, when I did the exam, they asked me about uh, Airwave, which is uh, the legacy uh, management console before um, before Central came out. And it's like, oh, that's great. That wasn't even in the book. <laughs> legacy features. <laughs> I mean, I knew it because I professionally, but it's like... Uh, but like they literally asked, like, "Hey, what menu do you click to?" Uh, oh God! Add a VLAN. And it's like, okay. Well. <laughs> and uh, I can get into more particulars, but uh, that's like the basic one without getting in trouble. Yeah, yeah. But uh, and like, uh, but yeah. Um, if you guys want to do it, don't worry about it. But uh, it's just uh, in some ways they're going to go deeper than CCNA, and some it's not. But. Uh, you're pretty much going to have to buy the uh, HP study book mm. uh, from the HP store. You're not going to be able to get it on Amazon, I believe. Okay. And then you can go from there. All right, cool. And, uh, yeah, that's pretty much it, I think. Nice. Uh, so I'll just do another round of any other questions or comments. Uh, we got a question from Kelvin. When are you vacationing in Aruba? Well, we can't really vacation anywhere now, but maybe someday. Mm -hmm. Oh, is, Calvin. Oh, Calvin. Is Aruba actually based in Aruba? It's not, right? No, it's in um, uh, San Fran. Okay, yeah, fair enough. Cool. I'm guessing one of the guys just needed a vacation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome. All so, right. well, yeah, uh, yeah let's wrap it up. Uh, I'll let's switch back to cameras if you want to uh, end oh, the yeah, sure. screen share. Here, let me get your picture there so I'm not awkwardly staring at uh, nothing. <laughs> uh, where did I put your screen? Nope, nope, nope. Where is Jeremy? There you are. All right, nice. All right. Uh, looks like you're still sharing the screen. Oh, I have to stop that, huh? Uh, I have to have at least one boomerism. Yeah, of course. Of course. It's not uh, a live stream without a boomerang. Exactly. Let's see here. How do I... Oh, there's on the corner. Uh... Okay, nice. You're back. Okay. All right. That was a good time. Thanks. Um, so we covered Aruba. Very Cisco-like in a lot of ways. I think uh, those of you watching would have recognized a lot of the syntax and just how the CLI works in general. Um, yeah, like Donald said, it's, uh, it's definitely something you can look into studying, but if you're working on the CCNA, that's a lot more valuable as a general certification to get you into networking, into IT. So definitely focus on that first before you 
sort of branch out into other vendors like Aruba. You agree with that? Uh, yep. Yeah. Yeah, and I'll just say you can go pretty deep in all the stuff there. Like you can, um, like there's a there's a lot of stuff there that we just shied away from, like because uh, mm -hmm. they go pretty deep into advanced routing and security and right, right, that kind of stuff there. So like uh, uh, the CCNA is a great foundation there because at the end of the day, like uh, the CCNA, uh, CCNA is like one percent of like something what like say the CCIE has. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. It's, arguably, it's like there's so much depth to it all. Uh, like there's so much out there there that you want to have a good foundation and yeah it's it's fun to play with these in the lab just don't get distracted and uh, uh, you know just uh, I'm not entirely sure if um, you guys are allowed to download the um, Aruba image without um, oh, okay uh, contracts uh, I don't actually know okay. uh, I have one of the curses there where I have access for so much different things. I don't know what's <laughs> you don't know what yeah, what's actually available for free and what's just a... So try it if you guys are interested. If not, then just put a pin in it. You're not missing out much. Um, I mean, um, uh, you're not missing out much in the sense that, like, uh, uh, there are other things you can learn if you want to learn other vendors. Mm, right, like Juniper or something like that. Yeah, Juniper. And, uh, like, I would maybe recommend Juniper over Aruba just for the fact it's a different syntax and it just forces you to... Um, uh, understand the differences. Mm, yeah, for sure. It's not, uh, yeah, not nearly as Cisco like. Well, it's not Cisco like at all. It's a totally different CLI. So, yeah. So if you can learn Juniper and you learn Cisco there, like something like Aruba, you can basically, you can basically just uh, figure it out for the command line there. Uh, yeah, even if you just kind of brute force it. Yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, a lot of it's not magic there. Like they don't change the logic on you. Like OSBF is always going to be OSBF. Mm -hmm. PoE is essentially just going to give you power to a port. Like it's uh, yeah. Uh, they're not vendors aren't trying to uh, make their product uh, hard to use unless they're uh, extreme or make the check. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yep. Yep. Not fans of those. I see. No. No. Uh, have you ever used extreme? Then. Uh, you get your P uh, PTSD. Okay, I haven't. Luckily, I'll uh, try to avoid them in my career as much as possible. All right. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll probably end it there. Yeah. And, uh, sounds good. We'll talk next time. Yeah. Hopefully, uh, we'll in, uh, do what uh, wireless it sounds like, and uh, let's keep in touch. Sure. Let's do another one in a couple months, and yeah, let's do wireless. Maybe Cisco or Aruba or whatever. Yeah. Or, or uh, yeah, I got Meraki. I got. Nice. Um, I got. Uh, uh, all the Cisco, I got uh, enough uh, Riba APs to uh, get radioactive. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> and uh, I'm supposed to be getting uh, Juniper missed access points. Uh, oh, cool. I gave up on them, but someone said that they're giving them, so we'll see. Nice. Cool. So, uh, I'm aware of this guy, so we're over there. But other yeah. than that, uh, it's been fun. All right. Thanks for coming on. appreciate it. Uh, thanks to everyone for watching. And if you have any comments, feel free to. Uh, Leave them in the comment section. I'll forward them to Donald. And oh, how can people get in contact with you or get in touch with you? Oh yeah, so I have a YouTube channel. Um, yeah, I linked that I think in the description, description already. Yep. Um, I have uh, a blog that I haven't wrote in like a year, so I should probably write something. <laughs> uh, and then um, those are the main ones there. Otherwise, I'm in most of the networking related Discord. So I'm in Network Chuck. I'm in yours. Yep. Uh, and then at the Cisco study group, which is uh, my original baby, and uh, I kind of stole in the early days. And then uh, there, I'm in David Bombel. So uh, if, it, if there's a networking conversation, you can usually find me or counterpart, my uh, Asian knockoff. <laughs> Asian knockoff, Kelvin. Yeah. Younger Asian knockoff. Uh, so, um, <laughs> yeah, but uh, I'm around uh, if pretty much any time there's some kind of Cisco kind of conversation, I'll find my way there. Yeah. And then, uh, uh, otherwise, uh, connect with me on LinkedIn if you want. Uh, uh, I'll typically accept you there and get back to you there. I wouldn't recommend emailing me. I don't mind if you do, but uh, just uh, I will find your email like months later and be like, "What was this?" <laughs> <You know? laughs> right, right. I understand uh, that. Do not email me if you expect a response because it's nothing against you. It's just uh, I get way too many emails a day there that uh, mm. unless it's like right in front of my face and really important to me that second it's not happening yeah yeah of course 
All right, so subscribe to Donald on YouTube, connect on LinkedIn if you want, and join these various Cisco discords. I uh, just linked mine in the chat, but uh, you know the Cisco study group, David Bombles, Network Chucks, join any of them, and yeah, you can ask questions. Okay. And this weekend I'm supposed to do the BIOS certification, so that should be fun. Oh, wow. Awesome. Good luck yeah. with that. Oh, uh, uh, well, uh, you have to make a video or talk about that next time or something, because mm -hmm. uh, I think that's going to be quite the uh, rumoring. Quite the rumoring. Sounds good. I'm looking forward to uh, hearing updates about that. <laughs> okay, right, guys. Yep. Cheers. I'll uh, end the stream now. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Thanks again to Donald, aka the Packet Thrower, for coming on. And uh, talk to you guys next time.